The Rune Smith. Chapter 191, Choose Your Class. I guess everything is ready. Roland looked down at a crystal that was on his desk. He was now in his office that was filled with various books and notes concerning his runic research. A lot of time was spent in this room deliberating runic programming that he was slowly becoming an expert in. How do these things work? Before using this strange crystal he decided to just pick it up. A thought crept into his mind after receiving his new peculiar skill. Is this just a magical item like any other? Perhaps I could. Though the urge to test something rose he had to stop himself from activating his new identification skill. The class change crystal was probably a high-level item, if he attempted to use his newfound ability to scan it, he felt like a migraine would be the least of his troubles. Previously he was already able to decipher regular spells and convert them into runic language. The question he had was, could he do it with any magical item? Were there limits to this skill and if he could just use it to help him understand magic even more? After gaining this skill he was becoming convinced that all magic was more uniform. If he saw the runes just like a programming language then perhaps all other schools of magic were just software that could be made with it. This didn't mean that all magic could be translated into runes. Perhaps there were some restrictions or outside sources of power that would be needed. In his old world, there were a plethora of programming languages all with their pros and cons. If I figured out how to make runic versions of this crystal, I bet the church would have my head. A runic creation that could work like a class change crystal would probably be seen as blasphemy. Even worse if he could just engrave it on metal that could last through the class change without breaking. He would be eradicating the hold of the church that it had on the class change market. I should probably focus on my class change, not like that skill is usable. He gave out a sigh as he knew that if he attempted to use the runic eyes on something complicated they would start bleeding. For the time being, the decision to slowly level this skill up was made by him. He would use lower level scrolls and spells to gently progress it without getting a debuff each time. Perhaps when it leveled up a couple of times it would become usable. Thus the thoughts of his new skills usage was tossed into the back of his head. The crystal was in his hand while he was sitting back in his chair. After clenching it tightly he activated it like he already did four times before. Here I am again the more it feels like my past life was just some kind of bad dream. Roland was looking out through what appeared to be his old apartment window. He knew well that everything here was some kind of illusion and that he was only in a replica created from his old memories. Is the view becoming clearer? When he first changed his class the whole place outside was somewhat foggier. Now on the other hand he was convinced that the view on the street was becoming clearer. It was as if he could see further outside the more he progressed through the classes. While this was an interesting thought he wasn't here to reminisce about the good old days. At this point in life, he had mostly given up on ever returning to his old world. While his real parents were still out there, it had been so long that they had probably forgotten about his existence. Fifteen years. While the PC was loading he tried to remember some of the faces of his previous family members. It didn't seem that his high intelligence stat would help him out with the old memories, most of their faces were a blur. They had become a distant memory and the new world that he was in now was his new reality. Hmm. Roland was quick to use the mouse to bring him to the class change screen. There he saw quite a large number of pixelated avatars. All the old classes were there as they never went away. Even though he was a tier 2 class holder, it didn't mean that he could pick a tier 1 class if he chose to. No mage classes as always. There was one class that he was somewhat interested in, it was the rune mage class. Normally he should have had all the prerequisites for it but it was not there. This was something that he expected as it was not there the previous time that he attempted the tier 2 class change. Let's see there they are. He turned to the crafting classes and instantly saw a couple of new ones, these were clearly there now because he had started working on his golemic creations. When he hovered on one of the walking pixel representations he was given one of the names. Golem Craftsman. This was the simplest of the classes but it wasn't the only one there. 
It depicted a tiny pixel version of himself working on something that looked like an iron golem. Then right next to the golem craftsman class was a runic variant just called the runic golem craftsman. It was clearly the superior version that focused on runes. Golems came in various shapes and sizes, runes were mostly used by dwarven craftsmen to make them work. This didn't mean that a person couldn't make one with enchantments or with the help of mages. But with the help of runes, a craftsman could fashion one themselves without having to expand the size to fit the bulky enchantments on them. A golem-like spider drone that he created would be hard to come by when fashioned by an enchant smith. The limiting factor was also in the lack of customization that those types of golems faced. Yet, they were somewhat easier to find as they were simpler in design and came in lesser variants. Most of the bulky humanoid monstrosities like an iron golem were created through enchant smiths while the more specific designs came from rune smiths like Roland. Runic golem craftsman seems like the better choice but there are more golem designer and runic golem designer. When he read the name a certain title popped into his head, it was the one that he achieved when he first created a custom variant of the spider drone. Thanks to the title he was probably able to unlock the more prestigious version of the golem craftsman and its runic variant. Not many craftsmen were able to design their own creations. Most of them just regurgitated old models and most of the time produced an inferior version of it. Only after understanding how to build one from scratch could they even attempt to customize. Roland on the other hand made sure to go through everything. He didn't want to just copy others' work, he wanted to create new options for himself. His class was somewhat special thus he needed to change almost all of the schematics he was given. If he wanted to augment himself further he needed his creations to profit from all his rune-related skills. Most of the old plans tried to limit the mana usage or cut on the materials. He on the other hand didn't need to worry about mana that much, he could create items that would make a regular person pass out from one use. Is there something better? Before making his choice though, he needed to see if there was something even more interesting. He had hoped to find another lord type class but even after going through all the options, there weren't any. Roland leaned back in the gaming chair that he was sitting in. The lack of any lord type classes was something that he was expecting. The runic variants of the classes were already rare and prestigious. Then that variant popped out of nowhere and gave him a higher stat multiplayer. After receiving this class he did some research or at least tried to do. It was still a topic that he would rather evade so he could not drop the class name directly. What he did was just look up more research material concerning special classes, ones that might even raise the stat multiplier. There were some records of unusual classes that raised one stat multiplier in the Magic Academy records. They were not mentioned by name but they did exist. They were somewhat lacking compared to his Lord class which made it seem even more outstanding. There was something interesting about them that they all shared with each other. It seemed that they had specific limiting factors. It was mentioned that such classes which went above the regular tier multiplier were one-offs. A person could only gain one per tier. This of course could have been untrue or just meant that the people with these classes didn't meet the requirements to get two of them. Was Roland different though? He didn't think he would be able to just get more prestigious classes without an end, this one was already more than he had ever expected. What to do then? There were some options, first, he could just wait and try gaining more titles, perhaps some new traits. He could try waiting it out to maximize all of his runesmith lord skills, the new runic eye of truth included. The problem was time, leveling up all of those skills would probably not be easy. He would be wasting years of experience points if he didn't change his class now. Some of them would be kept over but there was a limit. I don't think I have the freedom to wait. Another sigh escaped from his mouth. If he could then he would probably decide to wait. The leveling process wasn't that important to him as long as he could progress his skills. But he still lacked the capabilities to protect himself or the people around him from enemies above his tier. The times in this city of Albrook had been good to him. Years of peace and mostly progress had continued after he arrived here. This didn't mean that this would last forever. If the old foes didn't show up, new ones could be around the corner. 
This world was not safe, danger lurked everywhere. While the skirmishes with the other countries didn't break out into a full-blown war, it was also something real. Being a talented craftsman and a commoner he could be easily forced to participate in it. Peace and quiet was not something that he could see on the horizon. With the coming of the young noble, the market was now open to him but this would bring more trouble with it. For the coming battles, he needed any help that he could get. If this class turns out to be crap I could always go for tier 3 sooner than I originally planned. While Roland didn't want to cut his classes short he could always reach tier 3 when he hit level 150. This would mean that he would leave this runic golem designer at level 25 which he wanted to avoid. After receiving the special eye skill from this current class he was interested in what this class would offer. Without maximizing the new tier 2 class he would not be able to get anything similar as these types of abilities only appeared at higher levels. Roland started moving the mouse cursor through the other classes yet again. Old and new classes littered the screen which caused the pixelated representations of them to get smaller. He almost decided on the golem related one but then he spotted something that he had missed. Wait what is this one runic engineer? The representation of this class didn't showcase the tiny person working on a golem so he somewhat ignored it. Instead, it depicted the class working on some other contraption instead. It was hard to pin down what it was but it was mechanical in nature. Could this one be better? He thought back to his runesmith lord class that kind of encompassed a broad range of skills. In a sense, it was somewhat a combination of the rune mage class and the regular runesmith class. It allowed him to easily access the inner workings of the runic operating system while also boosting his basic rune crafting skills as well. If this engineer class was something similar it could go beyond golemic creations. It could very well help him create other things besides golems like his generators. Perhaps it would give him more bang for his buck than just a runic golem designer. This was getting complicated now. Before he made another decision he decided to hover the mouse over each and every class to see if there was something even more interesting. After spending a couple of minutes he ended up back at the two choices before him. Roland asked himself a question, did he really want to just hyperfocus on golems? Was this the only choice that he had? If he was a person of this world he would certainly go for the golem option. It was a well-studied profession. He had gone through many books and schematics thanks to his connection with the Magical Academy. The runic golem designer was the safer choice but it probably didn't bring anything new to the table. He would probably just gain some skills to help him work with golems and their cores. What he could expect to get from it was skills that would let him do his job faster but he would probably be limited to golem cores as the base for all of his creations. The golem cores had some flaws, one of the biggest was their fragility. Even when a craftsman placed the core on the inside of the golem, enough strikes from a sledgehammer from the outside could generate enough force to crack it. What if this engineer class gave him more options? Could he perhaps design something different than a golem core that wouldn't be as fragile? Perhaps he could alter it in a way to suit his needs, not every runic item needed a golem core to run. Well I could always leave during the trial and go with the other class if it's bad. Thanks to having money he would be able to retake the trial even when he failed. He could also end it on purpose and come back later if the class turns out to be incompatible with his needs. Only after passing the test would the class be locked to his status screen, before that he could test them all. After weighing the pros and cons of his current situation a decision was made. The runic engineer class was selected by him and the VR headset popped out as always. Roland placed it over his head and waited for the trial to start. The world around him started to change as he was transported to a new location. The bright light that filled his vision previously slowly subsided as he found himself in some kind of open area. The first thing he noticed was the stone slabs on the ground along with the somewhat chilly environment. It looked to be some kind of storage area, to the sides he could see various materials that he was familiar with. Metal ingots. Tools like blacksmithing hammers, tongs, and even larger devices like a forge. This was certainly not a coliseum that he remembered when he attempted the runesmith lord class change. It seemed that this one would be more about crafting than combat but what he was supposed to make was the big question. 
I should look around, there is always a short time before these tests start. Thus Roland took a step towards the shelves containing various items. The place that looked like a huge storeroom had to have some clues on what he was supposed to do here. Chapter 192, A New Trial A New Test This place is a lot larger than I expected. Roland was looking at the high ceiling of the storage facility he was walking around. After going through it he realized that it was probably the size of an airplane hangar. There were rows upon rows of shelves and racks. On them were various items, some out in the open while others were in cardboard boxes. Everything was somewhat organized and there were even labels on the boxes along with sections dividing the various materials by type and use. After going around the place a few times he did discover a few other interesting things. One of them was an area that was clearly meant for crafting. It was on the far end of this large storage space. It had it all, a large smelter that had a somewhat similar design to the one that he worked with. Not far from it was a nice workbench along with a forge, it was a nice smithy that every blacksmith would be familiar with. This wasn't all as right next to this place was some kind of office. In it he found a whiteboard with a set of markers with which he could write on it. There were also many sheets of paper of various shapes and sizes. It looked like some kind of space where he could create schematics for items. This somewhat gave him an idea of what this test was about but there were far too many materials. He would probably be able to make a small battalion of golems with everything here as golem cores were amongst the items scattered on the shelves. There was one peculiar thing about these items, not everything was just raw materials. Some items were out of place as he even spotted complete joints that would fit on some golemic creations. It was as if instead of making something from scratch he was supposed to assemble it from the parts scattered around this place. Maybe the raw materials are only there to fill some gaps. Roland spoke out but no one replied, after examining this section of the area he decided to go towards the other end. There he found something peculiar that made him think that it could be used for the coming trial. Various boxes made from some transparent material were lined up. After giving them a knock he realized that they were made from something similar to plexiglass from his old world. What made these strange were the handles on the front through which he could open them. Do I need to place something into these? These glass containers gave him that impression. It seemed that the test would ask him to make something and then place it inside of one of these transparent cases. They all varied in size the smallest one was around half a meter in length and width while the largest could fit a whole car into it. Behind these transparent containers, there were some peculiar features that he was familiar with. One of them was a timer, this one was a more modern one. It was divided into six sections that were probably for hours, minutes, and then seconds. This reminded him of all the previous timed trials that he took. It was clear that he would have some kind of time limit to produce something and then perhaps place it in the glass object. Then below it was something more interesting, it looked like a big flat TV screen. But just like the clock, it was turned off. The screen had no buttons nor could he see any remote control to turn it on. Then to the side of this screen, there was some kind of rectangular slit. It was quite narrow and it was not letting any light through it which made it seem that there was nothing on the other side. I read about some of these tests but none of them were like this one. Roland made sure to study up on all the possible trials that could come up. Normally when it came to crafting classes they would only need to create an item that would be graded by the system. Then when battle classes were involved they would mostly just need to defeat a set amount of enemies. The places that these tests took place were more in line with the world outside. But for him, there was a mix of old and new technology. Even the VR headset and his old room were something that was never recorded by anyone else. This place that he was in also looked like some large company storage from a shipping company from his old world. I guess these tests take into account the life of the person taking the test. This only makes it more difficult to anticipate them in the future. His old life and his new one were beginning to mix together. The old trials seemed more in line with the new world he was in but this one did look different. But what was he supposed to do here, there was no writing on the wall and no indication of what he was supposed to build. BRRRP 
while he was looking around for more clues he heard a strange sound coming from the slit in the wall. It sounded strangely similar to an old printer that he once had and to his surprise, a white sheet of paper started to come out of that narrow opening. He could clearly see that there were words being printed onto this white paper. This was probably a clue to what his task would be. Roland thus quickly moved over to the piece of paper to grab it before it was dropped onto the floor. This is instructions for manufacturing. What Roland was holding was probably the item that he would be building. The words looked to have been printed with an ink printer and as he was going through them he also noticed that one of the glass containers started to change. The metallic part produced a glow while the others remained the same. I guess it wants me to make this and then place it into the glowing glass container. Roland scratched his head a bit after going through the piece of paper. The instructions were kind of vague so he wasn't sure what he should make of it. Requirements Asterisk between 300 to 600 luminance asterisk give out a warm glow asterisk resistant to minor shocks. The list was quite small and also included a luminance factor in it. Thanks to Roland's broad knowledge he knew what it meant. Spells that produced light were counted in that measurement scale. He had already created runic lights and even configured them to produce a specific luminance rating. I see. There was also another change in the environment, besides the now glowing glass case the large clock on the wall started glowing. A number appeared in front that showed 12 and it was followed by more as the time started to pass. 12 hours. From how fast it was going he was assured that he had half a day's time to complete this project. The first test for him would be to fashion some kind of lamp that could take some hits without breaking. Twelve hours didn't seem like a lot but there were various items around these shelves that would make the process a lot faster. He would obviously not need to create everything from scratch as he just needed to find some parts and combine them. There were also no real limits of the shape or size. At most, it needed to fit into the half-meter tall glass box but besides it he was not limited in his design. But was there something more? Did he really only need to look at these three points and fashion it accordingly? The lumination factor won't be hard and this warm glow, I can just use a fire-based rune though it didn't put anything specific about the heat. The only tip towards the glow was the warm part. He could only eyeball it, perhaps he could fail if he made it too hot or too lukewarm for the test. The main part that he was concerned about was the shock resistance. This made it seem that he would not be able to make an old-fashioned light. Luckily he was not a regular craftsman, he imprinted runes into hard metal to make them work. Making something like a shock-resistant lamp would be quite easy. First, he would need to find the correct components, no limits to the materials were mentioned so he could probably go with anything. This did seem like a trial test, the instructions were minor and he had a lot of time. Probably after he fashioned this runic lamp he would be shown what this trial was truly about. For now, he was unsure if it would be measured on the three bullet points or if there was something more to it. First, let me find a power source. While he would like to have used his own battery design he was unsure if that would be possible. He was only able to charge them after making the wind turbines and wiring up his entire workshop. It was a long process of development but luckily for him, he did find monocrystals that would do nicely. They were in an aisle filled with other gem-like items. Many monster crystals of varying shapes and sizes were also there but they all capped out at Tier 2. The largest one that he could see was somewhat similar to the Tier 2 boss monster dinosaur that he had defeated previously. Thanks to an old experience he knew that using a power source along with a weak runic enchantment would be a bad idea. Something like a runic lamp that only needed to produce a glow similar to a desk lamp wouldn't need that much mana to work. Luckily mana fluid was also here and he had already seen some other parts with which they could go together with. Thus Roland began assembling the required components and then brought them all over to the crafting area. While he thought that he had a lot of time, it took him quite a lot of it to find everything that he needed. The whole place was quite new to him, even with the labels it was difficult to get everything that he wanted. First came the power source this would be mana fluid that was going to be inserted into a small metal cylinder. The fluid came in a canister that reminded him of ones used for fuel in his old world. 
he had found a small funnel to help him pour it into the cylinder that first needed to have a hole punctured into it. The tools here are outdated. He had hoped that this trial would somehow produce his runic power tools but there weren't any. It would have been easy if he had his runic drill along with his heating wands. It would have been easy to just get the fluid in and then weld it shut. Afterward, he could inscribe runes over it to make it into a working battery. For the time being, he would have to revert to his old blacksmithing techniques. What would be the battery was hollow on the inside so he only needed to puncture a hole through it after heating it up. The mana fluid was somewhat heat resistant so even when he was closing the opening via more melting, it wouldn't blow up into his face. It just needed the proper runes on the outside to prevent it from overheating later when the lamp was drawing power from it. With the battery in place he now only needed to concentrate on the outer shell. The only requirement would be to make it glow, give out some heat and be resistant to minor shocks. This could be achieved in various ways but he was limited. There was no time to make something eye-catching. The test didn't mention that the item that he made required to be artistic in nature. For that reason, he decided to make it work while ignoring its outside appearance. Thus the somewhat ugly and rough outer shell was made. It was fashioned out of deep steel plates that he was very familiar with. He had found ones that would go nicely together, to the bottom plate he would attach the power source by melting some metal and letting it set. The required runes on the battery were already set in place before he attached it. In the end, the whole thing ended up looking like a box. On the outside, there were visible runes that were engraved on the shiny grayish deep steel. After years of rune crafting it was quite easy for Roland to plan out the entire runic structure without any need for a proper schematic. Everything just clicked into place and after injecting mana the box started giving out a light of exactly 450 luminance. He decided to go for the middle spot from the description as he was hoping to get some bonus points for hitting the sweet spot. With a lack of instructions, he decided to make the box give out light in all directions equally. Thus it could be placed on any side and it would continue glowing. The whole procedure didn't take him the whole 12 hours as he still had about 5 remaining. Probably if he was more familiar with the layout and had his own tools he would have done it faster. The moment of truth came as he arrived at the glowing glass case. In his hand, he had the somewhat bulky looking light box. On one of the sides, there was a small circle through which he would be able to turn it on. The test didn't mention anything about on and off switches. I hope this is enough. After turning it on he placed it into the glass case. He still had some time that he could spend on some improvements but he felt like speed also counted into the test. Perhaps he would be given more time for the next creation if he turned this one in faster. The moment he closed the container he could see the light on the ground go out. At first, he expected it to just vanish but instead, the whole glass case started sliding down into the ground. It was similar to the previous trial he took where the workshop slid down into the battleground to make way for the battle. Here it was a bit different as soon as the container with his item disappeared into the ground it started going back up again. There was a difference though, the square box that he placed inside was no more. So what now? He looked at the empty spot where the lamp he made was previously in. The glowing had stopped and now he was just waiting. It took a few moments but the clock that was ticking down had also stopped which meant that something was happening. Soon the monitor that was below the timer suddenly went on. At first, it looked like static, it was as if there was no signal but with time he began to see something on the screen. It looked like a humanoid figure. It started out somewhat blurry but soon the image became sharp. A mannequin. What he saw was not a human, it was some kind of puppet. It had all the required joints that a person would find on a dummy. The face was lacking in any shapes and was devoid of eyes, a nose, and a mouth. This strange thing was just sitting in a chair while leaning forward. Then Roland noticed it, the box that he made was placed on some other books that were on a desk. This desk was the one that this puppet was sitting in, it made it look like it was trying to read another book while using his box as the source of light. What is this? At first, Roland was not sure what to make of it but then he remembered some of the old games that he played when he was still in the old world. 
There were some games where you added things to the world and then watched a simulation play out. For instance, he would create a bridge from provided parts and then see if the simulated cars could pass through it without the bridge collapsing onto itself. This looked somewhat more intricate but it was somehow trying to simulate a person reading a book. Probably the light requirement was for this part and soon he would know why it also needed to be shock resistant. The mannequin started moving around and it elbowed the stack of books that the light box was on. The box fell down to the ground along with some of the other books. The box had to take some damage from them but survived through this fall. The puppet slowly leaned back down to pick up the box as it went back to reading. From time to time he would also see it reach out towards the light, it was as if it was trying to warm its cold hands on it. I guess that's why it wanted it to give out a warm glow. Roland was baffled by the strangeness of this trial. It seemed that he would need to predict the simulated scenario that would take place on this TV screen. Along with following the instructions that were probably events happening during the simulation. After a few minutes it was completed and the image turned back to the static. Before he could deliberate if he did well or not the screen shifted to another image. This time around he could see a table with words in it. The moment he read the first one he already knew what it was. Chapter 193, A New Trial A New Test Part 2 Roland's eyes were glued to the display screen on which a table appeared. It was similar to a status page but it didn't have any numbers to it. Is this my score? I guess instead of numbers and percentages it went for letters. This made him think of a school grading system that some countries from his previous world had. Speed a. Design. C. Functionality. B. Plus. Rune quality. A. Simulated event. B. Plus. Final grade. B. Plus. It seemed that A was the highest grade that you could get from the test. If it was anything like in his old world then F would be the lowest. While he did good on the test there was one that stuck out from the rest, the grade for design. Probably making it just a plain old square with nothing else lowered it. Do I need to make it look more intricate and fashionable? He pondered this for a moment while looking at the grading system. It was clear to him that the three bullet points that appeared on the piece of paper were the main requirements. In it were some clues for that simulated event that he was now graded on. Perhaps if he didn't rush it he could have gotten some better results. It was still a lamp that did its function but perhaps if he altered it to be standing up on something he would have gotten an A in functionality. The test seemed to be lenient as it gave him A, B and for it anyway. Perhaps the other tests will have more bullet points that count towards the grade. Roland continued to look at the screen that had given him his rating. There was one small problem, even though he continued to stay there, nothing happened. The timer above it continued to tick down instead of stopping which at first made him quite confused. Did he need to do something else? Was the test not finished? That's not it. He shook his head as he was convinced that this part of the trial was over. The small hint of what was happening was the small text under the large table with his grades. Please wait. The clock above the TV screen continued to tick down and it would take some hours until it reached zero. What was happening was probably due to him finishing up fast. Before the clock counted down to zero the next stage of the test wouldn't start. This left him with slightly below five hours. Now if he was correct then spending some time in this hangar to look around would probably be a wise thing to do. There were some sections that he didn't examine and there was also the lack of proper magical tools that he was used to. In five hours he could easily assemble some helpful items that would probably help him through the next few tests. This was probably the reward for getting an A in speed, what this trial was testing were his capabilities of assembling. He was given the basic tool for everything but would these be enough for the completion of the later tests? While he had his theory there weren't that many indicators that the next test wouldn't start while he was gone. Thus for the first hour or so he was forced to remain around this area. He continued to peek at the screen while going through the shelves and gathering materials. Luckily for him, there was a section with some baskets and even a cart that was strangely similar to one a person would find at a store. For the time being, 
he concentrated on gathering resources that could aid him in further manufacturing. For this, he would first need precise runic welding wands that could help him combine the various pre-made materials here. From what he was seeing this was not a test on his blacksmithing skills, it was more of a test of his manufacturing skills. In some aisles, he even spotted fully made sword blades that were only lacking a hilt. In another section, there were various hilts that just needed to be matched with the correct blade and correctly assembled. In his shopping cart he had also brought over quite a bit of mana fluid. While he had a lot of mana himself sooner or later it would run out. Crafting simple runes didn't drain him too much but he needed to see the bigger picture. Creating a proper power generator was impossible but he didn't need to limit himself to it. Thanks to the many resources around he did not need to worry about such things. There was no need for him to make a generator of any kind. Converting electricity back into mana was not needed here as he had enough mana fluid to go around. What he needed to watch out would be to contain all of this fluid in a resistant container through which he could power the tools. For this reason, he had acquired a large drum that was made from a resistant alloy. It was a mix of some metals that he was familiar with like durasteel and deep steel which would make it adequate. This drum didn't have any sort of openings for some reason but this made it perfect for his power generator. He only needed to puncture the top and then fill it up with Elokin's fluid. But before attempting this he would need to inscribe the correct runic patterns on the outside and also check if the drum wasn't too thick for the runes to work. There was a certain limit at which the runes would be unable to draw the mana from the fluid but in this case, he was lucky and it would work. I have the container and the fluid, even the cables. Roland looked at the precisely created cables through which he would be able to run the mana through into his new tools. For some reason even this was in a section, the more he continued to look around this place the more he concluded that he was supposed to alter this simple workshop. But while it was nice to find all the materials he needed it also pointed towards a more concerning matter. With so many components everywhere the scope of the trial started to grow. The further tests would probably get increasingly more difficult and he would only be limited by his own resourcefulness and not by the supplies he was handed. That leaves me with three more hours can I do it? Roland looked into the distance where he could somewhat see the clock. It was ticking down normally but what would happen when it finished was unknown to him. Would it just spit out a new page or would there be something else? He still didn't know what the rating system was for, was A, B and even enough to go forward or did he need to get an A? There was also doubt in his mind about the validity of this runic engineer class that he was trying out for. It didn't offer him any new knowledge as some of the tier 1 trials before he started them. For the time being, he could only speculate on what it would offer him in the future. Thus while the time was winding down he concentrated on preparing his new makeshift battery that would help him use some of the tools if he ran out of mana. The process was kind of rudimentary as he only needed to heat up the metal drum with the help of the forge and hammer runes into place. This required a lot of concentration but for some reason, the mana flow in this trial was somewhat good. There were also no distractions, it was deathly silent in here as only the sounds of his hammering echoed through it. The whole structure was probably only an elaborate illusion that he even might be able to examine if he activated his eye skill. But he decided against that as he was afraid that he would incapacitate himself if he tried to examine such an intricate magical environment like this. This should do it. With the help of his enhanced body and skills, he was finally able to create his makeshift energy generator. From the outside, it looked like a boiler with a few sticks sticking out from it and it was also covered with various runic symbols. These stakes had wires wrapped around them which then led over to his runic wand. This one, in particular, looked like a soldering iron and it was used for something similar. The end would go quite hot and be able to melt most of the metals in this place. This tool was made so that he could weld materials together as it was a lot faster than doing it the old-fashioned way. There was no time to produce higher quality tools like a drill yet but perhaps if the next trial was an easy one he would have enough time to tinker some more. When the clock in the distance was at about 5 minutes Roland decided to leave this workshop area. It was time to find out what the next trial was going to be, probably he was in no danger of failing just yet. 
After arriving he waited diligently for the clock to run down to zero. When the last minute started he also heard some kind of strange dinging sound. It was clearly an indication that the time was running out. The numbers on the counter changed colors to red as they continued to tick down until they zeroed out. Hey! The TV that looked frozen finally sprung into life almost at the same time as the time ran out. Roland was a bit surprised the moment the next screen popped up which represented a somewhat cheerful looking panda. It looked very cartoonish and was holding a large congratulations sign above its head while dancing at the same time. A sort of victory tune played to accompany the panda's dance. This whole thing was accompanied by some music that suddenly was cut off along with the video on the screen. The whole TV went silent and turned off as if the strange spectacle didn't occur. Before Roland could ponder this occurrence he heard printer noises to his left. The slit in the wall started producing another piece of paper with new instructions. Is this supposed to be vague to test the person changing the class? Roland wanted to give out another sigh as these tests were starting to annoy him. Most of the time he had no idea what he was supposed to watch out for. Perhaps next time he would do as bad as he could and fail so he could think of a better strategy in peace at home. Let's see what do they want me to do this time, this one is somewhat different. Asterisk a party of four, one dagger rogue, one shield warrior, one ranger and a spear warrior are heading through a treacherous forest. Soon they will encounter wild goblins that are led by a tier two hobgoblin shaman, they find themselves without proper weapons. Asterisk. Instead of a list of requirements, he was given a short description this time around. He could already imagine four puppets representing these classes going into a dark forest and being attacked by goblins. The biggest problem in this scenario was that he wasn't particularly sure of how many goblins they were up against. They had a chieftain that was a shaman, this was something similar to a human mage that used various rituals to fire off spells. This type of monster would use incantations in its own goblin language. It used its minions to protect itself while throwing various destruction spells at any people that it came across which made it a dangerous foe. The strategy to go against such a foe would be to somehow keep it from casting spells. The party that he was working with did have a ranger with them. This tier 2 class was good at shooting a bow which could be used to keep the shaman from casting. When looking at the composition he could imagine the warriors protecting the ranger while he kept the shaman busy. Then the rogue could try sneaking up on the shaman for an assassination attempt. But would that even be an option? Roland didn't know how these adventurers would act in the scenario. He was supposed to supply them with items that would help them survive a bout with the goblins. They all had tier 2 classes and their opponent was of the same tier, it wasn't mentioned in the page but he expected there to be some other hobgoblins in the mix. Is it enough to make weapons for them? Will it be that easy? He wasn't sure, this was only the second test. It seemed that it might be up to the quality of the weapons and nothing else. This would probably be the focal point of this timed trial but it didn't mean that he could add a few items that could shift the tide of battle. But that depends on how much time I will have. Roland mumbled to himself while looking up towards the clock that was above him. There the first number shifted to 24 before quickly dropping down to 23. He would have a day to prepare everything which wasn't a whole lot to make four sets of weapons. After seeing the timer a clicking sound escaped his mouth. Before moving back to his shopping cart he decided to take a look at the glowing glass case. This one was larger than the last one and thanks to his skills he was able to measure its size accurately by just looking at it. One of the weapons that he needed to create was a spear. These though varied in length and size quite a bit. This container had a limited capacity and he would need to limit himself to around two and a half meters. If he placed such a spear at an angle he thought it would fit. He then quickly turned around to where he left the shopping cart. First he needed to get the parts for his creations. The spear would be one of the easier ones to create as he just needed to find a long enough shaft to fit on some of the pre-made spear tips that he had previously seen around this place. The spear was one of the easier weapons to use and had various advantages over the popular swords with their superior reach. For the spear tip, he would need one with some wings at the side which would stop the tip from over-penetrating during a thrust. 
If he just fastened a smooth tip, it could overpenetrate through the monster's body and get stuck which could cost the user their life. Then for the other warrior, he would go for a regular one-handed sword and shield combo. As previously seen he would only need to attach the hilt along with any add-ons like mana stones to lower the mana requirement for the runes that would be added later. Thanks to the names of the classes of the adventurer party he would be able to choose the correct runic enchantment. No one in this party had much mana which limited his choice to the more basic spell augmentations. This was not a problem as he believed that this was just the part of the test. Putting on the strongest runic enchantment could be counterproductive depending on its user. Not many people would be able to use Roland's custom runic armor as they would just get a migraine after a few spell uses. It was the same in this case where less was more. Everything that he needed was here. If he actually had to make everything from the ground up, there would be no way for him to pass this test. But as it was, the most time would be spent on modifying the hilts to house sockets for the mana stones and then doing the runic augmentations correctly. Let's get to work. He nodded to himself and then disappeared between the aisles of materials. Chapter 194, A New Trial A New Test Part 3 I feel like they are missing something. Roland was looking at the basic set of weapons that he created for the next scenario. The weapons were fashioned with mana stones and were ready to cause some damage. While the clock was ticking down he decided to examine the items that he created with his analyzing skill. Winged Spear Deep Steel Lesser Piercing Rune Highest Long Sword Deep Steel Lesser Sharpness Rune Highest Spiked Kite Shield Deep Steel Lesser Mana Barrier Rune Highest Longbow. Bronzewood Lesser Steady Aim Rune Highest. Dagger. Deep Steel Lesser Sharpness Rune Highest. Throwing Knife. Deep Steel Lesser Paralyze Rune Highest. Dagger. Deep Steel Lesser Sharpness Rune Highest. Arrow. Bronzewood Slash Deep Steel Lesser Fire Rune Highest. Arrow. Bronzewood Slash Deep Steel Lesser Velocity Rune Highest. He decided to use one of the materials that he was very familiar with, deep steel. There were many pre-made parts that he only had to attach himself. It was clear that this test mostly rated his problem-solving capabilities and not just pure crafting. For the Spear Warrior, he went with a model with wings below the tip and along with a piercing rune that would augment the tip during penetration. This magic increased the forward momentum during a thrusting attack and helped generate more power. The other weapons also had similar simple enchantments that he had been able to perfectly rune craft on them. Roland was worried about the mana usage thus he also placed mana stones on each of them to further augment their longevity. The biggest problem that he faced was with the bow. This was not a weapon that he was very familiar with and the material used was unfamiliar as well. Bronzewood was able to stomach certain runes without going up in flames as regular wood but it also was someone hard to work with as he had to actually carve out the sockets for the mana stones and glue them in with a mana transmitting adhesive. Luckily for him, there was everything that he needed here. Thanks to his leveled up analyzing skill he was able to quickly find the correct vial. While the sections were somewhat labeled most of them didn't go into much detail. For instance, if he wanted to get a chain of some sort there would be a shelf full of them out there. They would be separated by type and material but the labels didn't go into much detail further. He would need to use his own eyes and skills to determine which were made from deep steel and which were from regular iron. Without working at the forge and having to haggle with merchants for years he would probably not be able to get through this task. He was also forced to fashion multiple arrows from the same material. They weren't that difficult to make but he decided to place small runic enchantments on them all. He didn't know if the scenario would give the archer from the party their own arrows so he was forced to make quite a lot of them. While he wished to place something like a guiding arrow spell on them, he feared that it would be too much for the archer to handle. The bow already had its own runic enchantment that would help them steady their aim even in a stressful situation. It didn't drain much mana as it didn't really help with the arrow shooting it just eliminated some of the outside factors that would make an archer miss. Most of the arrows he assembled were just regular ones without any enchantments whatsoever. Then he made two that he thought could be used for the more tougher opponents. 
the lesser velocity rune when activated would increase the momentum of the arrow fired. Thus it would add to the penetrative power and speed of the arrow making it into an even deadlier projectile. It would use up some more mana but in the hands of a skilled archer it could be used to penetrate through some hard defenses. Then there was the fire rune that he thought could be utilized in the forest setting. They were going against goblins which would probably try to surround them while hiding behind trees. The flame room could be used to set the environment ablaze and force the enemies out of their hiding area. Yet it could also backfire if used wrongly and the party got themselves entrapped in a burning forest. The biggest problem with this scenario was that Roland had no way of knowing what the puppets would do. He could only hope that they would not randomly fire off the weapons he provided to them. The rogue was also provided with some throwing knives that could paralyze their opponents but would he use them on a hobgoblin for a quick win or waste them on a regular one that he could potentially just defeat with his regular weapon. While this should do, I'm not sure the style grading will be that good. Roland wasn't really used to making beautiful looking weapons. He valued functionality over style any day of the week. Polishing these weapons to perfection and giving them a nice paint job could potentially raise that grade but it would also cause him to lose more time. The quiver that he fashioned for the arrows was also quite basic, produced from a tube-shaped leather container and some straps that he listened to it. The only stylish part of his creations were the various mana stones that were placed in strategic locations. Without them, the weapons and shield would probably look quite plain. Yet he didn't feel like wasting his time on making them more beautiful would be very advantageous to him. While thinking he turned his head towards the clock in the distance, twenty hours had passed since the test had started. He was finished with looking over his creations that were in working order. Now Roland could either place them in the glass case or add some finishing touches that would probably not add anything to their functionality. I guess the style and speed rating should equal themselves out. I don't need the highest grade, I just need to pass. After nodding to himself he packed up everything and made his way towards the trial area. There he deposited all of the items into the large box. The spear needed to be placed at an angle and barely fit along with all the other weapons. After closing the large container it started sliding down into the ground and now he just needed to wait for the TV to turn on. The TV screen activated after the time was up and presented him with a zoomed out location. It was hard to make out anything but the large trees that were everywhere. Soon it started zooming towards another location and he could finally see the party of adventurers that he had outfitted. Like in the first test, the represented humans looked similar to crash test dummies made from wood. These ones were wearing leather and even half plate armor. The shield that he made was quickly recognized by him as the puppet that was in the front was holding it with its wooden hand. It strangely fit perfectly into its hand, as he had no measurements of the people using these weapons he tried to imagine your average shield warrior's size. The spear warrior was in the back while the ranger and rouge were on the sides. They were in a basic formation with the warriors ready to meet the danger head on. They continued to just walk slowly through the forest while Roland was giving a somewhat third-person view of the scene. The screen didn't have any buttons or remote so he was unable to see where the goblins would be hiding but soon the action began. The rogue that was in the middle turned to the shield warrior and it was as if he was trying to say something to him. The warrior nodded while raising his shield to protect his head, this was then quickly followed by a few rocks hitting the kite shield that he created. The rocks were something that some goblin tribes loved to use before attacking. While it would allow them to stun some of the enemies if being successful it also gave away their position to the adventurers. A blue light escaped from the shield that he manufactured. It expanded to form a wide enough mana shield to take all the rock hits from the front. While the rocks continued to hit the ranger looked into the distance while pointing out with the bow towards the small pack of goblins that were throwing rocks at them. Roland could see the quiver of arrows that he made being used. The ones that had a runic enchantment were standing out as the knock part at the end had been colored blue. The ranger puppet took out one of the regular arrows and fired it towards one of the goblins in the distance. A clean hit between the monster's eyes caused the other ones to scatter to the side. With so many trees and bushes to hide in, the ranger was unable to get a clear shot. While he was waiting the spear warrior and rogue moved towards the front. 
The peculiar thing about the goblins on the TV screen was how they looked. Just like the wooden puppet adventurers they were not very fleshy. They actually looked like stuffed toys and the arrow that went through the head of the first goblin just made some of the cottony insides spill out. Soon a battle erupted between them as the goblins burst from their hiding place. The party of wooden adventurers didn't seem to have a problem with taking out their opponents. Their runic weapons were glowing with a blue light as they activated them quickly. With the added magical enhancements they were able to cut through the rusty goblin short swords and wooden clubs with ease. It seemed that the battle was over and the six green monsters that were the height of ten-year-olds were down on the ground. While they were victorious Roland knew that it wasn't over, the scenario dictated that there was some kind of hobgoblin shaman which had not yet been defeated. After this little skirmish was over the journey continued and the party arrived at a clearing. There another battle waited for them, this time around with the big boss monster that was the hobgoblin shaman. The hobgoblins were more the size of a human, this one was the same. It was wearing a ragged black robe that made it look like some kind of warlock. In one hand it was holding a wooden staff with what looked to be a human skull at the top. The eyes had two red gems that were glowing and taking the form of some kind of spell. Due to the previous small skirmish, the monsters were already aware of the puppet adventurers. The shaman was standing upon a rocky ledge and looking down at the spot where the party of four came out. Before them were about ten small goblins with hobgoblins sticking out. It was somewhat hard to make out the real numbers as the TV screen kept switching around the scenes. But suddenly it started the shaman that looked like a stuffed toy animal opened up its mouth. The goblins reacted as they charged towards where he was pointing out with his skull staff. Magic gathered around this weapon which looked quite realistic, it was clear that the monster was chanting a spell. While Roland wondered why no one had decided to install any sound system to this spectacle, the ranger pulled out another arrow, this one was runic in nature. After taking aim he could see his bow glowing blue while the arrow shined in red. It seemed that the puppet archer was actually thinking a bit. The fire arrow that he made was shot in a nice arc not towards the shaman directly but the bushes that were right next to him. They quickly caught on fire and produced a lot of flames which caused the toy shaman to fumble its incantation. The bushes and trees looked very dry which caused the flames to quickly spread. While the shaman was standing on an elevated position there were still trees there. With all the produced smoke it would also be hard for any breathing. A caster's tone during the incantations mattered as well, if they were off by too much the spell would fumble. Only if they achieved higher levels and tiers would something like chantless incantation become unlocked. It seemed that this simulation took this into account as he could see the cute shaman coughing while running away from the flames. A fight ensued where the adventurers tossed themselves against the green yet somehow cute looking plus highs. With the help of their enhanced weaponry, they were able to cut open their bodies, the flesh inside represented by red cotton. It was somewhat hard to make out, the TV screen had a very limited field of view. It also kept changing angles and zoom. But from what he could tell his weapons were surviving the onslaught. Even the shield spike was used by the warrior holding it just as intended by ramming it into a hobgoblin's skull. Surprisingly enough he managed to predict most of the fight as the rogue did use the throwing knife to paralyze one of the hobgoblins near to the shaman. He then kept him busy until the rest of his party was done with the other plush monsters to then finalize their kill on the last boss. I guess that's it. After it was done they held their weapons high into the air while Roland spotted some stuffed toy innards on them. Just like last time the TV screen then turned itself off and shifted towards the grating portion of the test. Speed. B+. Plus. Design. C. Functionality. B+. Plus. Rune quality. A. Simulated event. A. Final grade. B+. Plus. Another B+. Plus. It still doesn't like my designs too much. Besides how they looked from the outside, the weapons he made functioned well in the simulated scenario. Now after getting his grades he was free to work on some new tools for the next scenario. He had 4 hours left from the 24 which still gave him quite a speedy rating. His little power source was used to help him connect a few parts here and there but he needed other attachments. 
one of them would be a drill and something to polish metals on. The grinding wheel would be an easy modification as he already had one here, it was just not connected to any power source. It was just one of the basic tools provided like the forge and smithing hammers. At first, he did think that the drill would be somewhat troublesome to make. Mostly the drill bits that he would need to make in various shapes and sizes. Yet for some reason, he did find them just lying around along with the nails in a section of this large storage hangar. He even managed to find a clamp similar to a drilling jaw and chuck. This was really just a test of his managing skills, everything that he needed was already here. With the four hours remaining, he managed to assemble a replica of his runic drill and then connect it to the power source. Now equipped with the drill and runic grind wheel he would be able to get his work done faster. Just as he was about to be finished he heard the sound of the clock. The last minute was ticking down and it was time to go check what was in store for him next. When he got there the last five seconds were going down until it zeroed out. After which the congratulations screen started playing and was followed by more printer sounds on the side. Roland took some time to look at the paper and then the clock above. He had already been stuck here for one and a half days yet he did not feel sleepy at all. This was not due to his sleeping resistance, this testing area was somehow making him not sleepy. I think this test is going to be one of the long ones. He had read up on some trials taking weeks, some even months. There was no clear rule of what one could get. While a month passed here on the outside world it would be only a couple of seconds. Two of the tests gave him high ratings yet they were only the beginning, it would only get harder from this point forth. Chapter 195, A New Trial A New Test Part 4 It has been about a week or has it been more? Roland was looking at the clock in the distance while also screwing in a couple of bolts to hold a golem's joint together. Just as he had predicted the tests were quite lengthy yet not that hard. At this time he was already on the fifth one which told him to create a golem. The third test was another large order which consisted of mining tools for a group of ten miners. He was given a specific list of requirements that he had to adhere to. While it wasn't all that hard the number of items plus the lack of much time added together. After he was finished with the fourth test he was slowly wondering if he really wanted to continue with this class choice. It seemed to turn him into a factory worker that just went down through a list of commands that he needed to follow through. It did feel like he was in a simulation of a workshop and the piece of paper was a ruthless boss that didn't care if he would be able to complete the order or not. After the fourth test, he was close to giving up on this class. The skills that he would be receiving were still unknown to him but by what the tests were giving him he had an idea about them. Probably what he would be getting would be abilities that would aid him in manufacturing various contraptions, perhaps something to speed up the process. In the fourth trial, he needed to outfit a party of soldiers with ranged weaponry. After innovating his workshop it was not hard to emulate his runic rifle designs. There was plenty of mana fluid to go around and the gun was easily manufactured as it didn't really possess that many moving parts as its modern day counterpart. Luckily his scores were high as he had feared that perhaps going with a more traditional crossbow design would have been better. The wooden defenders didn't seem to have trouble shooting down their foes with the rifles and he had slipped in enough replacement batteries to last them through what looked like to be a fortress defending scenario. Then finally when he was about to reconsider this test he was given the fifth test, there he would need to design a golem. If he was getting a golem to work with then it should mean that this class also offered some benefit to making these creations. As if out of nowhere an isle appeared with various parts that he could assemble a golem with. Previously he had seen some basic golem cores but only after he managed to get through the fourth trial did the place alter itself. He had already had a suspicion that this place reacted to what he needed and somehow created the required components that he would need to complete the test. What he only needed to do was to assemble them correctly. From the beginning, Roland didn't think that this class change would be harder than the Runesmith Lord 1. This was mostly due to the second Tier 2 class test being geared towards people with Tier 1 classes. As someone with a somewhat broken Tier 2 class already he was able to compensate in all of these trials. His large mana pool allowed him to create better and more precise runes without getting tired. 
The higher stats multiplier made him work faster while also still being precise. This allowed him to finish the tests quicker and thus upgrade his workshop in the process. This golem that he would need to make was now the fifth trial and it seemed to also be the most difficult one. He even found himself going to the office area to draw up some schematics. The note with the bullet points was stapled onto the wall and next to the whiteboard. Requirements asterisk create a humanoid warrior golem height between 180 cm and 210 cm weight up to 500 kg armaments need to include a one-handed weapon and shield. The instructions were vague as always. He predicted that his creation would probably need to face off against something. While the requirements were for him to only build a golem that was carrying a sword and shield around, this didn't mean that he couldn't innovate. The more he could cram into the golemic creation the more likely it would win against the foe it would be facing. Thanks to how this test was set up he was able to find a plethora of parts. What he needed to do is to assemble the framework and then armor it up. The hardest part would be to alter the golem cores as they seemed to be just blank. Yet thanks to this he was starting to think that the class he was getting would be also receiving some golem core related skills. This was mostly his aim for the new class, unless he would get something that would make his life easier it would have been better to go with the runic golem designer. What he was aiming here for was a class that would not only help him with creating golems but also various other creations. The golem core could be used for much more than just golems or at least that is what he was thinking. It was just something to store the runic software on, it would make the runes work as the runesmith programmed it in. There could be many other uses for them, he could see them working as the basis for many smart devices. Mage Towers for instance implemented something similar but more sophisticated. He couldn't really get his hands on that research as the professor denied him. His explanation was that research of the arcane arts would only muddle his current knowledge. Focusing on rune crafting was already a huge undertaking and he somewhat agreed with the sentiment. Learning a new field of magic would just stifle his progress and perhaps in the future, he would have enough of it to continue with this path. After creating a schematic for a two-legged golem he got to work. This time the timer was maxed out at 99 hours. The strange thing about this fact was that the clock wasn't ticking down. It looked to be stuck in limbo even after he spent a full day of working on the current design. There could be a couple of reasons for this but he went with the most probable one. The time for this test was probably over the limit of this clock counter. As he continued to work this also became true and after adding up the hours he came to the conclusion that a week's time was given to him for this test. This might be the last one so I should focus otherwise I'll lose my mind. The place was filled with fake light, there was no day or night cycle and if the clock wasn't there he would not know how long he had already been here. It was clear that one of the things that this trial was testing was his mental fortitude. Day by day there was another order that he needed to fulfill. Even when he was done with the trial he continued to slave away to improve the state of his temporary workshop. Without his parallel thinking skill, he felt that he would have not been able to finish the tests as fast. It was as if he was not alone, as if he had a second person working with him. While one part of his mind was working on the correct rune paths in his head the other was assembling the golem's leg joints. There was no crane to hoist this new creation up for easier access. He had to somehow assemble everything on the ground and then have his creation stand up on its own. Getting it into the largest glass case would otherwise not be possible. First came the legs that would have the bulk of the weight in them. A humanoid golem was not as balanced as the spider drones he made. This type required a solid base as if he fell down gravity would cause additional damage. Luckily the magic runes somewhat counteracted the weight problem of these constructs. Without it some of the larger models would just crumble under their own weight. In his old world, there was something called the square cube law. In short, it stated that an increase in size would be followed by an even larger increase in weight which would in turn limit the scale of possibilities by quite a bit. In this world of swords and magic, it seemed that this law could be circumvented. Either by the use of magical materials that could withstand the increase in size or by magic. This was also part of his own studies, the runic diagrams he was given from the magical academy could be applied to golems to help them not crumble under their increased weight. 
The biggest issue with circumventing this law by magic was that it required constant magic. If the golem ran out of it while moving the joints would break apart. The one that he was creating here would not be that big so it wouldn't need to be boosted by magical runes that much. Yet if it was, its movements would be enhanced along with its speed which could turn the tide in the coming battle. So he continued with the less than optimal assembly on the ground. Luckily the golem didn't need to be too big nor bulky. Thanks to this he didn't have trouble bringing over all the required parts. The toughest part wasn't actually assembling the outer shell but mostly working on the inner workings that was the golem's operating system. This was the only thing that the trial ground didn't provide him with. Thankfully in the past, he had gone through a plethora of golem cores. Even though he had stuck to making spider-like golems he had tinkered around with smaller humanoid ones. The design that he went with made it somewhat look similar to his own runic armor. But instead of himself on the inside, it would be filled out by the inner skeleton. The chest area would house what some called the golem's heart but to him naming it the golem's engine would be more appropriate. It was its power source without which it would be unable to function. Due to it being filled out with monofluid or monocrystals it was required to keep it somewhat further away from the core that was susceptible to breaking. What he could do was insert as much fluid into the tank that the weight limit allowed him to do. Luckily this wasn't his first rodeo so after assembling all the parts that he was given into a proper skeleton he was finally able to activate it. The golem came up to exactly 2 meters and was slightly taller than his creator. Its head was empty for the time being as he only needed it to stand up. After working non-stop for half a week his creation's framework was ready. He followed one of the most basic designs which had been already tested by many other runesmiths before him. Now at this half point what he was left with was a canvas onto which he could deliver the finished product. The legs came out a bit bulkier than the rest so that his creation would have a lower center of gravity and keep it from being tipped over. Luckily at this size, he didn't have to worry about not being able to stand back up nor about the inner skeleton from snapping from too much stress. The chest area was also a bit bulkier than the rest as it housed both the golem core that was closer to the upper area and the golem heart that was closer to the groin. The shoulders were rounded to emulate the look of a generic full plate armor. The golem would not have trouble raising its hands or performing human-like movements. On its left hand, he attached a large round shield that was outfitted with several runes. On the inside of the shield, he had placed various mana stones to minimize the mana usage as he always did. The note didn't say that he couldn't attach the shield directly to the golem's forearm which he did. Instead of having his creation hold the shield he used its hand to form a weapon. It looked like a stump with a gem at the end but in reality, it was just a modified spell wand that used the gem as a focus point. For the melee weapon of choice, he went with a large mace. The golem had enough power to swing it around and he was unsure of what his creation would be fighting but he was counting on it being another golem. What better way to test if the trial taker was proficient at making golems than having it fight another one? At the top point, it had a head that was mostly just there to house the main golem eye. The head part had two of them that were in the front and also in the back. There was not enough time to give it any more alternatives or to update the operating system to use them. Thus the time for his creation that he fastened and welded together from all sorts of parts to be tested had come. It had a modified version of a basic runic combat program along with all the rest. Roland was not quite there yet when it came to altering the software too much so he would need the old tried design to do most of the heavy lifting. Hope this goes well. With only 15 minutes remaining on the clock, he ordered the golem to climb into the glass cabin into which it barely fit in. Soon it slid down into the ground as all his other creations did before. The TV screen soon turned on to show him an arena that was quite similar to the one in his previous class change trial. Just as I thought, it's made from wood. Roland could see his own golem that was made from deep steel and some other more monoconducive materials on one side. On the other, there was something that looked like a bulky wooden puppet with a shield and sword. This is something that he expected. All the other simulations involved either stuffed toys that looked like monsters or wooden puppets. Roland wasn't sure but the wood that the golem was made of was something similar to bronze wood. 
There were other kinds that would fit a larger humanoid puppet like this which it probably was made of. After the enemy became clear Roland let out a sigh of relief. He wasn't sure if this was by design but being against a golem made from wood would go in his favor due to how he customized his golem. Wooden golem was somewhat similar to his own. This was probably due to the fact that he modeled it by a popular design. It didn't look much different than a regular rune-crafted iron golem that a person could find at a proper dwarven workshop. Soon the two golems spotted each other, each golem's eye homed in on the enemy before them while giving out a red glow. Even though these weren't large golems they were still slower than the average human warrior. This was why most people would never order one at this size as its decreased size was more manageable. Though with better schematics and materials one could create golems that are both agile as well as deadly. By the way, these two were fighting reminded him of old toy commercials where small plastic robots punched themselves out until one lost its head. Their movements were robotic and even he that wasn't a masterful warrior could tell where the next strike would come. At first, he was worried that his creation would soon falter. While the deep steel was more resistant than the wood that the wooden golem was made from, it was assembled in a worse way. The wood was lighter so it could be thicker and didn't require a skeleton on the inside. His golem on the other hand had many hollow sections that wouldn't last a prolonged pounding like this. But it wasn't limited just to its mace, it also had a shield hand with the gem at the end. At this moment it was pointing at the wooden construct. In a matter of moments, a burning inferno surged from this magical arm. It engulfed the wooden puppet with magical flames and continued to release them while the opponent tried to shield itself. Even though the wood it was made for was quite resistant, it was not fireproof. Soon it caught on fire and started to burn up from the outside. While the damage that it was taking was still moderate, the constant increase in heat did its work. The wooden joints soon started giving out while the golem was swinging around and it soon lost one of its arms. Now without a shield in hand, it was mostly defenseless while Roland's deep steel golem still had its along with the mace that started delivering crippling blows. The end result was as he expected his golem remained standing after suffering some minor damage during the exchanges while the wooden one was down on the ground and burning up. Even to the end, his golem continued to blast it with a torrent of heated mana as if it wanted to make sure that the enemy was dead. Only after the light in its golemic eye faded did the test come to an end. Was that the last one or do I need to spend another week in this place? Even though Roland didn't feel tired or hungry having to be with his thoughts for two weeks straight was slowly getting to him. It was as if he spent a whole month in isolation while having to constantly use his parallel thinking skills to manufacture new items. Then as he was looking at the grades he felt the whole place rumbling. It was similar to the way his other class trial ended. He could see a hidden doorway appearing right next to the TV screen that was congratulating him for his victory. Now is this the end or just the way to a more difficult trial? Chapter 196, No More Stress Final Grade B+. Roland wasn't even that much interested in his final grade while looking at the door that appeared next to the TV screen. It looked like a regular wooden door with a regular handle, he just needed to reach out with his hand to open it yet he was considering if he really wanted it. This would either take him to the exit perhaps a similar area with books like on his previous trial, or to a new area with more testing. The first four tests added up to about two weeks of time spent with the last one adding another week of constant work and no rest. While for some reason his body wasn't feeling tired he was reaching a boiling point. By the way these class change tests were structured he expected this to be the end. It was a bit easier than all the other trials that he took but this was something that he expected. Tier 2 class change quests were more difficult at Tier 1 as they didn't scale as well when a person at a higher tier was taking it. If he had to take this trial when he was at level 75 he wasn't so sure that he would have been able to pass it. At that point in time he didn't really have that much knowledge concerning golems or their cores, nor did he have the stats to help him manufacture multiple weapons at once. With his runesmith lord class, he was able to quickly copy the runes from his memory. This helped him immensely during the tower defense section of the test. Without the diligent studying that he had done throughout these years, 
he would also be unable to pass this easily. It was more thanks to his diligent work that he was able to somehow breeze through here and not an indication that the class was useless. Now he had a decision to make, does he walk through this door and claim his new class or would he try to fail? How would he fail this class trial after solving all the problems? From what he knew there would be some ways to not finish the trials after passing most of them. One of them would be to just wait it out, these things did have a time limit but how long that would be he didn't know. The fastest way would be to get would be simulated death, he would need to die within the trial ground. Pain was felt in the same way as if he was in the real world so he would rather not have it go that far. Will that runic golem designer be any better? He didn't get any information about what skills he would be getting from neither of the two classes he was interested in. The name was the only thing that was a hint along with the little sprite on the TV screen. The runic golem designer class was probably part of the dwarves heritage. It would probably be impossible for him to get anything out of them. The thick-skinned crafting race never appreciated outsiders within their field of expertise. He wouldn't be surprised if they bought up all the skill books and pieces of knowledge that allowed others to go down this path. What he could expect to find in the trial of this class would probably be golem crafting. Perhaps the trial would be similar to this one where he only needed to assemble parts and have his creation battle with other ones. He expected it to mostly focus on just that while this runic engineer class was more broad in scope. Only at the fifth iteration of the test was he given golem parts to play around with yet he would require similar skills to pass both class tests. The big question was if he should specialize or broaden his horizon. Did he only want to make golems or utilize different techniques for more varied runic creations? In the first place, the runic engineer class was already focused on one field that was runes. Not like he would be spreading himself too thin and becoming a jack-of-all-trades master of none. His main discipline would still be runes and crafting he would just be able to apply them to more, perhaps together with the runesmith lord class his tier 3 options would present him with something unique. Are there any engineers in this world other than me? While Roland had gone through a second-rate college he was still an engineer with a degree. He was stuck repairing computer parts but thanks to that he was convinced that this class was somehow tailor-made for him. Probably without the skills that he gained from his first life he would be unable to get this option. With that in mind, he took a step towards the door and placed his hand on the handle. After moving it down he pushed the door open, a bright glow greeted his face that quickly faded away to show him the inside of this room. Without doubt clouding his decision he finally took a step towards his new destination. Ugh. Roland collapsed on the ground while holding his head. A splitting headache was taking over as the stress from the class change trial flooded into his head all at once. It was as if it was waiting for this very moment to knock some sense into him. After passing through the door he arrived at a study. It was very similar to the one he saw during his last class change trial. There he was given books to study runic engineering that allowed him to gain new skills and traits. The biggest problem was that he needed to go through the books one by one and study them. This caused him to spend even more time without getting to rest his mind there. Luckily one of the passive skills that he received would help him in the future as it was stress resistance. Stress resistance. Passive skill. A person with this skill can resist stressful situations more and doesn't buckle under pressure easily. The skill is boosted by the user's willpower stat. Runic restructuring. Active skill. Allows the user to immediately alter a runic structure to one of his choosing that is not above the current runes tier, the skill is dependent on the user's intelligence stat. Creativity. Trait. A trait that allows its user to develop and express their ideas in new ways to help them innovate. Resilience L1 Passive Skill This skill gives its user the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, their resolve unwavering. The skill is boosted by the user's willpower stat. After the moment of weakness, Roland managed to gather himself off the floor. The pain quickly subsided which could be thanks to his new resilience skill. He felt that his headache had become numb and while there were some after effects he wasn't feeling that bad. Engineers were sometimes forced to work long hours without sleeping while constantly tinkering on their machines. 
thus they needed to be resilient while also resistant to bouts of stress that could cause them to fumble. Together with the skills that allowed him to go without sleep for days, he felt like he was turning into some kind of robotic existence that could work for days without end. Now it seemed that even if he didn't sleep his mind would not be fatigued anymore nor would he feel a need to rest. After leveling those new skills high enough he might be only limited by his body while his mind would never falter. Then there was the strange creativity trait. It was supposed to help him come up with new ideas. The explanation was vague but creative people seemed to be able to find ways of going around problems that were previously not there. Perhaps with the help of this trait he would be able to create new runes from old ones? The last skill was also quite interesting runic restructuring. It gave him the possibility to alter his runes in a more drastic way. It was a skill and would be quite instantaneous, which during a battle could save his life. For instance, if he had a runic wand that could only produce a frost spell. During a battle with an enemy that was susceptible to fire, he could alter the runic structure during the confrontation to alter it. Probably the rune would degrade slightly in the process but if he leveled this skill up further the damage done to the runic structure could be erased. This wasn't the only boon that was offered to him in the trial. He was given several books on runic constructs that he could read up on. With their help his manufacturing capabilities were now boosted, there were also some secrets concerning golems that he had not heard of before. With the help of this newfound knowledge, he would be able to fashion golems with improved operating systems. While I have gained some new knowledge and useful skills, there isn't anything, in particular, that would affect the golems or at least not yet. This was just the beginning, his new class was still fresh. Even though there were no new abilities aimed towards his golems there could be later when he gained a few levels. The quite painful eye skill that he received was only delivered to him at the end of his last class. Now with the resilience skill in his bag of tools, he would probably be also able to use it for a longer period of time. After glancing over his new boost in stats and confirming that his 2 times multiplier was still there he decided to get a move on. His body didn't feel tired but the experience of not getting any sleep for a whole month was somewhat weighing on his mind. But with the help of his new skills, he was able to waddle outside into the living room. There he found some leftover food on the table that he was quick to gobble up. Anything that he could find was taken in to replenish some of that lost mental energy that was slowly returning to him. Even with the new resilience skill, he found himself spacing out in the chair for a few moments before finally hearing a voice calling out to him from the side. Are you okay? Hey? Oh, it's you Elidia, yes I'm doing fine just give me a minute. Roland waved to her while smiling weakly. You don't look fine, why are you so pale? Oh well, I just need to walk it off, I'll be fine in a minute or two, must be the side effects of the class change nothing to worry about. He did not hide the fact that he had managed to change his class from her. Previously they even had a discussion about the possibility of him attempting it. While there was no danger of dying from such a trial some of them did weigh on the people taking them and this runic engineer one had been one of them. Why are you like this? You need to take care of yourself more, how about you go rest? Elidia shook her head around while getting closer. The first thing she did was place her forehead against his to check if he had a fever. Roland remained in place as the gesture was quite soothing to his tired mind. Yet while some dirty thoughts flooded his mind to use this situation he was really too tired to act on them. Yes, I should probably go to bed what time is it anyway? After so much time had passed during that trial he was somewhat confused about the time of day. Was it the beginning of a new day or was Elidia closing the shop down for the day? He was sure but when he asked her about it she started looking more concerned. After some struggling, he was shoved into his bedroom to rest. Now get some rest, Agni don't let him leave this room even if he orders you. A woo. Agni that had now become bigger and was a dire wolf gave out a resounding howl that caused some of the glass windows to vibrate. It seemed that he was pleased with his new guard duty as he curled up before the exit door while Elidia left to go outside. The rest was kind of a blur as Roland quickly fell asleep. Ugh why do I feel so heavy? At the break of dawn, 
he opened up his eyes, while he felt somewhat refreshed he also felt somewhat sweaty. There was something on his chest and it was far too heavy to be his girlfriend. When he opened his eyes were greeted by crimson fur that belonged to a certain ruby dire wolf. Agni, what are you doing? Get off me, you're getting too big for this. It seemed that his tamed beast had crawled into bed with him while he had passed out. This was something that occasionally happened but with each new evolution, it became harder and harder to stomach. Now when Agni was beginning to weigh more than even he did it start to become a problem. Woof! The moment Roland raised his voice he was hit in the face with something rather hard. It was the ruby tail of his wolf that was randomly swishing about. While Agni was quite happy to hear his owner's voice he was going through pain as his face was smacked around. For one reason or another, Agni's posterior was resting on Roland's chest and after a few swats of the tail was promptly removed with a forceful push. I said, get off me. The thud was heard along with Roland's shouting. Agni landed against the wall but he quickly adjusted to fall down onto his four legs. Instead of a punishment, it seemed that he took it differently as he just jumped back onto his master while attempting to lick his face. Roland found himself dodging the rather long pink appendage while using his parallel thinking skill. Regretfully some slobber got onto his shirt as the attack was quite abrupt. Not even he could have seen this rude awakening coming. Okay, run along now. After washing his face he released Agni outside. It was still early in the morning and it would take a few hours until Elidia arrived to open the shop. For the time being, she mostly spent her time at the orphanage while shortening her stays at his home. He did not complain though as he had other things to worry about, like the golem that he needed to produce. I guess I can stall it anymore, I need to make that golem. First impressions were important so he intended to put as much of his skill into this new golem variant as he could. But after the test, he had been through he thought that he would be easily able to come up with some nice improvements over the old models. Though before he grabbed his blacksmithing hammer he took some time to think about a new possibility. From the corner of his eye, he saw a small black satchel. It was just your average spatial bag with the smallest enchantment possible on it. This will either give me the biggest headache I have ever had or will be one of the biggest discoveries. He grasped the satchel in his hand and slowly headed downstairs, his target being the empty room where he previously tested his rune eye skill out. Chapter 197, New Field of Study Roland Arden L126 Classes T2 Runesmith Lord L50 Secondary T2 Runic Engineer L1 Primary T1 Mage L25 Tertiary T1 Runic Monoscribe L25X T1 Runic Blacksmith L25X HP 6106-6106 MP 14921-14921 SP 8955 -8955. Strength 161 Agility 127 Dexterity 195 Vitality 165 Endurance 177 Intelligence 230 Willpower 211 Charisma 18 Luck 11 There was a limit of how many passive class buffs he could select, with the runesmith lord one and the new one he needed to make a decision. After some consideration, he decided to go with his first mage class. It gave him a big boost to mana and mana regan while the runic blacksmith went for stamina. There was a lot of overlap between the runic blacksmith the runesmith lord and his new runic engineer class when skills were considered. Runic engineer Class Increases stamina by 30% and stamina regeneration by 20%. Lowers mana consumption while inscribing runes and using them by 15%. The passive buffs that this class was giving him made it seem that it was focused on work. The stamina increase and regeneration along with all the passives would allow him to work for longer without getting tired. His mana reserves didn't get much of a boost after attaining this class, 
mostly due to the runic blacksmith mana increase not being there anymore. But with how large his mana pool already was he wasn't all that worried. Then he also got a decrease in using runes which would probably still offer him more uses from them in the long run. After going through the list of new abilities of his new job he did want to give out a sigh. All of these skills would allow him to work more and get tired less. His initial goal was to work less not more but this system was just pelting him with abilities tailored to just that, working more. The stamina increase wouldn't only help him swing a heavy hammer for longer, it would also aid his dungeon runs greatly. The heavy armors that he wore did drain his stamina during battles and the increasing heat only added to it. Still, it was mostly a manufacturing class so there would probably not be many skills that would directly aid him during battles. Will the increase in stamina help me with this? Roland's status screen flickered away while he looked to his hand. A small leather satchel was there with one of the simplest spatial enchantments that he owned. The item he was holding was something that he once found in the dungeon. It probably belonged to a new adventurer that either died or ran away from monsters. The enchantment on it was quite faint, there wouldn't be space for many items but it was still better than bringing a backpack to a fight. Now the big question on his mind was, could he copy the spatial enchantment with his runic eye of truth? He placed the small leather satchel down on the workbench while standing in the mostly empty room. His head was already starting to hurt after the memories of the previous activations of this skill flooded it. The experience that he went through was truly uncomfortable and even after all of them the skill didn't level up once. Thus he could do two things now. Either he waited for this new skill to go through a couple of levels while he examined simple runes or go through with it now. The first choice was the more logical one as the success increased and the strain on his body would probably be reduced. Yet, for someone that didn't know what the next day could bring this might not be an option. Even though he might have gotten the stress resistance skill this didn't mean that Roland didn't worry about his future. Now even more after he was slowly getting attached to other people around him. If he was able to create a spatial rune then his work would be taken to another level. There would be so many new possibilities, perhaps he wouldn't even need to use the bulky golem on his mining attempts. Instead he could inscribe a rune onto his armor that could house some of his creations. This was quite a lofty goal as even the large spatial bags that he owned had their limits. Their size limit was mostly to about 4 to 5 square meters which was enough for cut-up monster parts, ores, and his golems. How difficult to recreate one bag would be he could only speculate, then he would need to worry about the implementation. These magical bags didn't seem to need any mana to work but this didn't mean that the runic variant wouldn't. While normally a person became more restrained this didn't apply that much to Roland. After going through many experiments he was willing to put his body through pain to achieve his goals. It would be the same now as he didn't want to wait months or years for this skill to level up. To prepare himself for this test he decided to bring along some of the leftover healing and mana potions. These were now slowly running out as he had been having to douse his face with them to make the pain go away. The pain numbing ones were the first one that he used while hoping that he could get through this. Resilience was his newest skill but he wasn't sure how it worked. It didn't seem that it would lower his pain threshold but instead let him recover faster from difficult situations. But he wasn't sure if willpower would help him with the pain but it might help him keep a cool head to note down the runic structure. Next to the satchel that he was going to examine was a stack of blank sheets of paper. Instead of a pen he would be using a pencil as he wasn't sure if he could keep his hand steady so the ink would not spill over. While he was confident in his memorization skills he wasn't sure what he was in for. This could be a new runic spell structure that was altogether different from the ones he had witnessed. The plan was to peek at it for a few seconds and then quickly deactivate the eye skill, then he would just need to scribble down what he had seen and continue. Well then, here goes nothing. Roland nodded to himself before placing the satchel on the workbench. There was nothing else around it besides one of the clear paper sheets and his pencil. After sitting down on a stool he steeled his resolve before activating the runic eye of truth. Ugh. One of his eyes started glowing to indicate that he was using this special ability. It took about a second but soon he started noticing glowing blue runes appearing on the spatial bag that he was looking at. 
This as before was followed by a throbbing pain to his eye but he powered through it. Seconds started passing and while holding his breath he continued to look at the runes before him. The structure was truly unique, it didn't seem to resemble any elemental spell that he had seen before nor any of the illusion ones either. It looked like a totally different field of study, spatial magic. This field of magic was already widespread through this kingdom yet it was a lot more difficult to get into than elemental magic. It required the mage to alter the space around them and the most prominent form of this field was spatial storage. His only contact from the magical academy would not explain much even when he asked. After more time had passed Roland started speculating that either the professor was stingy or he didn't know as much as he would let him believe. Now after witnessing the runic structure before him he understood that perhaps he was right in not offering him an answer. Within a few seconds, he was already sweating bullets and forced to halt his attempt. His hands continued to work though, every runic structure was noted down along with any speculations on how it might work. Yet there was quite a bit to decipher from this, the skill was somehow translating the enchantment into runic but didn't explain anything. Already he was seeing shapes that he had never seen before. Both at the circuitry and the software level of his knowledge. After the peak, Roland had to lean against the workbench while taking a few minutes to rest. His head was hurting as always but it was not a level that he could not continue. He wasn't sure if it was due to the resilience skill but he found the pain going away somewhat sooner than before. Thus after feeling better the noting down continued until a certain point where his hand started to shake. Finally, after the third activation, he seemed to have reached his limit. A lone droplet of blood dribbled down onto the white paper that he was writing on. It was clear that if he continued past this point he risked injuring himself greatly. Yet there was a small reward that followed after this punishing act. You have gained a new skill, Pain Resistance L1. Pain Resistance L1. Passive Skill. Anyone possessing this skill gains a resistance to pain, this skill is affected by the willpower stat. The moment the skill was added to his repertoire he started feeling better. With his abnormally high stats and the tier 2 multiplier, the pain resistance skill was boosted. Pain resistance hey? I need to be careful with that. Roland grabbed a healing potion from the side along with a mana potion. While the skill seemed good it was a double-edged sword. Pain was just a mechanism through which the body showed a being where it was injured. It alerted of the presence of the problem that could potentially cause harm and without it, a person would be unable to tell before it was too late. If his body became numb to any form of pain then he could let injuries fester. He could become unaware of an injury that he might have suffered. But it also would help him push through pain in dangerous situations thus he would need to be careful to not endanger his own body. Would be nice if I could use those priest spells. While resting his eyes he thought back to the time he saw Sister Kasha use her healing miracles. The healing potions were somewhat inferior to the divine magic a priest could perform. They were slower working and their potency was also lower at a base level. Buying high-grade elixirs would shorten the gap but those were hard to come by in a place like this. This was why bringing a cleric for prolonged dungeon runs was always a must. While the potions would run out the healer could recharge their mana with time and offer aid for a longer period of time. I should probably stop for now. Roland mumbled while looking at the notes that he made. Even though he could only glance a couple of times he had managed to draw up partial schematics of some of the new runes. For now, he had focused on the elements that he didn't know, then later he would be able to perform some tests. Yet he wasn't sure if he should be performing tests on spatial magic quite yet. What if he created a miniature black hole or got his limbs sucked into the warp space that these spatial spells created? This was a dangerous field of magic that had already caused some old archmages to vanish from the face of the world. While he wanted to continue, his body was feeling sluggish again. For the time being, he didn't receive another debuff but if he continued past this point he felt that it would appear again. Thus he decided to postpone his spatial rune research. There were other pressing matters that he needed to attend to, one of them was the golem that he promised to construct for the Lord. It would be his re-entrance into the world of auction houses and a chance for his brand to be released into the world once more. But before that, 
he also had another skill that needed testing, the runic restructuring skill. Thus he grabbed the notes that he had made and headed towards the main workshop area. There he rummaged through the shelves to find an old gauntlet made from regular steel. It was an old product that didn't have much worth now but he could use it to test this new skill. This gauntlet had an old rune that could produce a mana bolt from the palm area. With it, he headed towards the testing area where all of the previous ranged tests took place. Even before arriving there, he could hear sounds of spells being discharged. Oh hey boss, finished with your tinkering. It was Bernier and in his hand, he had the runic rifle. While the two girls didn't take the gun training too seriously his assistant did. He always took some time from his day to shoot up the training dummies. Regretfully he wasn't gaining any marksman-related skills even due to firing this weapon daily. Somewhat, I just want to test something, don't mind me. Roland just nodded at Bernier while entering as he didn't want to bother him in his training. The old metal glove that he was wearing didn't go unnoticed but he wasn't barraged with any questions as his assistant knew that he was busy. While Bernier was shooting up the place Roland tested out if his old creation still worked. After taking aim at a free wooden target he released a bolt of condensed mana. With his current stats, the weapon was enhanced and delivered a devastating hit to the poor wooden dummy. It didn't go unnoticed by him that the regular steel that this glove was lined with was deteriorating fast, even more, when he increased the output. But he was not here to congratulate himself on his improvements, it was time to test his new skill. Runic restructuring was activated. It was a strange feeling but he needed to somewhat focus on the runic structure of the mana bolt spell. For his first try, he decided to go with something easy, shifting the mana bolt spell to something similar which would be a mana arrow. While looking down at the glove he witnessed the skill activating. The runes started glowing in a blue light while altering themselves before his eyes. The mana drain on him wasn't that big all things considered and after about 5 seconds the spell had restructured itself into the new one. He held out his hand before the target again and activated it again. This time around instead of the bolt of mana an arrow shot out. But after one shot he noticed the drop in power along with one in quality. From the highest, it went down to high along with burning through some of the material it was inscribed on. The testing continued for a bit longer as he continued to alter between other mana-styled spells. Soon enough the runic structures started deteriorating into the lowest grades and finally into something that could not be used anymore. The old glove had gone past a point where a quick skill could mend it back into its old form. It's just at the first level so I expected this much, perhaps if I combined it with the rune-mending skill it would last through more punishment. It's not that I can't change the rune structure myself but this skill allows me to do it with little to no focus it's also much faster this way. While Roland deliberated on the validity of using this skill in combat Bernier had completed his aiming routine. He had walked over to where his boss was standing and mumbling to himself. Soon Roland felt a tap on his shoulder that caused him to lose his train of thought. Hey boss, not sure if it's the right time but I've finished with those golem parts that you wanted. Oh? Good job. Yeah, they are in the first workshop. It seemed that Bernier had managed to get through his Durasteel smelter practice, now it was up to Roland to combine the parts into a golem that he wouldn't feel embarrassed about. Chapter 198, Back to Work Most of it looks to be in order, he is improving but there is still room for improvement. After practicing his new skills and taking some time to bounce back from using his new eye skill Roland was now looking over the golem parts that Bernier prepared for him. While he had not abandoned the ways of the blacksmith he somewhat preferred assembling the parts than making everything himself. Bernier was quite skilled with his hands and had a lot of drive. It was clear that he had a chip on his shoulder and wanted to prove to the dwarves that rejected him that he could be just as good as them at crafting. His current class was Armorsmith but he was leveling up quite fast, soon he would be level 100. But this was not the time to worry about his assistant's progress. He had already wasted enough time on fashioning the new smelter and running into the dungeon to get more materials. This had allowed him to level up faster but he still needed to prepare something special for the coming presentation. 
The young lord seemed a bit suspicious but he was the best way of fighting back against the Dwarven Union. With his help they would not be able to go against him, at least not in this city. They had already wasted some profits in banning him from buying the resources that they could offer. In reality, a more symbiotic relationship with the Union would bring both parties more profits in general. Besides not earning anything from offering him base materials they were in a constant price battle with each other. This was a good thing for the adventurers that could buy cheaper magical equipment but bad for the stores and craftsmen making them. The only reason to continue on this path was that they wanted to monopolize everything. While they could earn more by directly working with him they could get more out of it later if they managed to remove him from the chessboard. When he disappeared they could increase the prices exponentially and not one would be able to do anything about it. Playing the long game hey. Roland mumbled while placing the familiar spider golem parts on the workbench. What he was going with would be more of the same yet after going through his last class change he wasn't sure if this would be enough. His creativity was quite generic and the number of C grades he received for his creations was staggering. While it was clear to him that outer appearance didn't matter that much when it concerned weapons he was still selling a product. If the golem that he created didn't seem unique enough for the rich merchants they would probably be inclined to pay less for it. This was not a weapon that a poor adventurer slowly saved up for, it was a premium product for the rich. His buyer base was different and he needed to think about who he was targeting this golem with. Would this be a toy a rich merchant gifted to their son or would it be something more? He somewhat decided on this part already after giving Bernier the order to make the parts out of Durasteel. This was a material that was reaching into the upper echelon of magical alloys. It could produce weapons that gold and platinum adventurers would use. This was in the ballpark of tier 3 which he needed to take seriously. While I have to limit myself to my old design this doesn't mean that I can't change it. While some time had passed he still had enough to apply changes. This was not the time to be sloppy and he still had some leftover materials from his last dungeon run. Thus he decided to leave the completed parts here while he returned to his office to draw up some schematics. It was somewhat a strange feeling to go through his past designs. The drawings started to lack something, he could not put his finger on it but everything started to seem bland and uninspired. Was it the effect of his new class or the skills that he picked up? He wasn't sure but inspiration hit him hard. The remainder of the day that he wanted to spend assembling the spider droid frame was instead spent on redrawing the golem schematics. There was much to correct and some of the parts would need to be thrown out or cut up to fit the new design he was going through. This was not something Roland was familiar with as he found himself spending hours on the smallest details. Solutions that he didn't previously see became quickly apparent to him as he continued to go through his old research papers. It all clicked into place and when he was giving his drawings the finishing touches he was roused from his trance by a knock on the door. Are you okay? Hey, what? It was Elidia's voice and it was followed by Bernier. See, I told you he was doing fine, it's just a blacksmith thing. He could hear the two talking with each other as if there was something wrong. Then he also noticed it, the whole room that he was in was a mess. There were old torn up schematics everywhere with the new ones pinned to the board on which he finished working on. I'm coming in. Elidia opened the door that was unlocked with a concerned look on her face. Bernier peeked from behind him with a sorry look on his face, as if he was apologizing for letting her in. You really need to take a break, you've been in this room for four days, get some sleep. Hey? It has been four days. Roland was shocked at the revelation that he had been cooped up in this workshop office for that long. There weren't any windows here to help him tell the time and he decided to not place any clocks either. Then he had also made sure to make the walls thick enough to not let any sound in from outside as Bernier's constant hammering could get annoying. Look at this place, how can you work in this kind of mess? You didn't even eat the food I placed outside. Elidia looked at the room that was turned upside down, it seemed that the situation was serious as she never really came to the workshop. She knew that he liked to work long hours but even then he never spent this much time without coming out to see the light of day. 
It seemed that with his new class he really didn't feel fatigued as much and only now when they mentioned it he started feeling sleepy. I'm sorry I must have not heard you but I was finishing up anyway, I just need to. You want to continue working. Roland flinched a bit as he noticed the change in Elidia's voice. Her eyes narrowed while a glare appeared over her normally cute face. It seemed that if he continued with working he would probably anger this lady. It was a strange feeling to be stared down by a small woman that shouldn't pose any threat to his life but for some reason, he felt apologetic for making her worry. Okay, I'll do it tomorrow. He slowly placed the pencil on the desk next to him while Elidia followed his hand movement with her gaze. Then slowly while moving the old schematics out of the way he started going towards the exit where her and Bernier were standing. Ah don't worry about this, I'll organize them later. Sorry boss, I saw you working hard so I told the missus that you were busy but I couldn't stall her for longer. When he was out of the room Bernier whispered into his ear. Now it all made sense why she was mad. His assistant fed her some excuses while he remained locked in his workshop. Not coming over for the usual meals that she prepared probably gave it away. The whole situation just made him smile a bit as he was not particularly mad for being disturbed. No that's fine but we're not. The only part that he wasn't sure about was that Bernier made it seem that the two were married. It did seem like that from an outside perspective as she did spend a lot of time in his house and even cleaned it from time to time. There was not that much of a dating culture in this world and not everyone went through with a proper wedding. Don't need to be shy, well I'll leave you alone. After giving Roland a hard smack to the shoulder Bernier left the workshop. When back in his home above only now did he notice that he had really worked through almost four days. The sun was already setting and even Agni served him with a hard tackle as if he didn't see him for weeks. His previous concerns of him becoming some kind of workaholic robot were slowly starting to become true. Even though he had managed to prepare a nice schematic for his product it was not something he wanted to repeat. There was more to this life than being stuck in the workshop, a middle ground needed to be reached. Elidia's food was quickly gobbled up by him which caused her to halt with the glaring. Their time was short spent as she forced him to take a bath. After working for that long he was beginning to smell and she clearly didn't want any part with that. Then after managing not to fall asleep in the bathtub for once he rested. On the dawn of the next day, it was time to finish up with his drawing and organize, it was finally time to prepare the modified spider golem. It would be about the same size as the older model but it would come with some modifications and a new frame. The parts that would be reused would be the legs and some of the inner components but the main chassis needed an overhaul. So, this part is going to be the abdomen and this is going to be the thorax. Back in the office, he had Bernier and his wife follow the new plan. The previous spider drones were made out of a single part and more egg-shaped while this new one would be a double parter. While making it composed of more parts would lower the golem's structure integrity it would add some other features. Back to the drawing board, I see, well what are we waiting for then, let's get to work. Bernier didn't seem perturbed by the idea of working more. The main reason was probably that he was grinding those levels and the more he worked on the smelter the faster he would hit that threshold. His larger-than-life wife was also very interested in the new design, not many craftsmen had the pleasure of working on magical golems as they did. So they did. Everyone followed the drawn-out schematics that Roland had created. All of the parts that were needed had a separate page along with the dimensions that needed to be kept. Roland was still a proper blacksmith, while he had less experience than these two he did not trail behind by that much. Having high stats was also on his side as both of them could only dream about having the amount of dexterity to aid them in their craft. The process was slow and cumbersome. Some of the runic repairs that he performed had to be postponed while he tried to reach the deadline created by the lord named Arthur. Perhaps he was trying too hard for his first real auction reveal but he wanted to leave a lasting impression. If he failed there was a possibility that the lordling could decide to pull back his aid and Elidia would be left out to dry as well. If the lord deemed it so he could instantly remove her from that building that was apparently breaking some old laws that no one really followed. This time around he made sure to take some breaks, 
the eight-hour working limit that he placed on his workers was somewhat ignored to a point. Bernier and his wife had no problem working 10 or 12 hours a day as they knew what was at stake. With the increase of stats, it was possible for them to power through more without the mental and physical stress being overwhelming for their bodies. But even if that was the case Roland was apprehensive about making them work for that long as he did not want to repeat what his old boss did to him. So when the 10-hour mark was reached he made sure to kick the both of them out. The days started passing and the new forge along with the new smelter had gone through a rough period. Luckily it did not break and the runic structures didn't deteriorate even after many hours of work. The difference in material was apparent as this new equipment would last him for years to come. Finally, after weeks of rigorous crafting, all the required parts were produced. Assembling them together came soon after but after the extensive practice Roland gained during his class change quest this didn't prove that difficult. The spider droid head was connected to the thorax and it was circular in nature. On this somewhat flat head he placed three golem eyes that would work as the main cameras. The head could slide around the circular axis it was placed on. Thanks to this solution even if one of the small eyes was damaged the golem would still be able to compensate. The abdomen that it had behind its head made it look like a proper spider. It was a bit taller than the head part at the front and could also open up as it was meant to function as a storage. Inside would be enough space for a spatial bag and a few replacement parts. Then in the front below the head came the most difficult component to manage, two smaller looking robotic arms that had multiple uses. Well then now I just need to revamp the whole operating system of this thing. He had spent designing this for some days and made sure that the whole construction was structurally sound. The hardest part was the weight distribution as the abdomen was a bit bulkier than the head part. But with the two multipurpose appendages on the front, he managed to equal it out. While the exterior of the golem was mostly in order now came the tough part. He needed to connect everything to the golem core. Instead of his own batteries, he went for a more traditional solution with a compartment for monofluid. This might take a while. It might have seemed that he only needed to push the on switch and everything would be finished but this was far from over. All the new armaments needed to be tested, if the golem ended up shooting someone at the auction house it would be his head that was on the line. Probably another month of work was waiting for him which would cut it close to the previous agreement that he had with the young lord. Thus he almost barricaded himself in his own workshop for the remainder of the day that he had. This time he was sure to inform Elidia that he would be working for longer than usual. Only after promising her that he would take a longer break after the auction house visit was finished did she relent. He did not forget to slowly draw up the spatial rune from the small satchel he found in the dungeon. With each headache, he was getting closer to something that would allow him to slim down some of the current creations. Soon the days were passing rapidly and the moment of truth was upon him, it was time to show his newly gained creation to the masses. Chapter 199 Visiting the Auction House Did I overdo it with this one? Roland was looking at what was his new golem. At this point in time, the golem was walking around and performing some simple tasks. Its two hands in the front were picking up wooden blocks and bringing it over to another location. While the robotic hands only had a three-digit design they could grab various objects. In the middle of this hand, there was a focus point. That would dispense spells along with some other ones spread over its spider-like body. This golem would be considered a higher quality product due to how many runes were on it but this didn't mean that it would sell. This only depended on the use it had for the person buying it. When it came to the market the best model wasn't always the one that was popular. Most people wanted the cheapest version that satisfies the given problem that they wanted to solve with the product. The golem that he produced could carry around items, mine minerals, and also protect itself. Yet with more that he crammed into it, the more it would cost to make. Would a mining company need their golems to have attack spells inscribed on them? Most of the time the specialized products won out over the multi-purpose ones. Thus after this one was assembled he was slowly wondering if he made the mistake of not focusing on one thing. It's too late to make adjustments now. Roland frowned a bit after looking at the slightly larger spider golem that he had made. 
the more he worked on it the more improvements he wanted to give it. In the end, he produced a multi-purpose spider drone that could fight monsters, mine, and be used to transport various items. I might have to bite the bullet and lose some money on this one. This made him think of all the resources he used to build this thing. Luckily most of them came from the mining spot he discovered so even if he sold it under the market value he wouldn't go out of business. But thanks to all of his work he did manage to improve the operating system even further. In his hand, he was holding a control rod. It had some buttons on it but he decided to make this remote control more similar to what the people in this world were used to. It didn't need much mana to run so it didn't require any mana fluid. The person just needed to inject it and then speak the commands out to make the golem perform tasks. Now, what remained was to give it a nice paint job and then do the presentation at the auction house. Are we done, boss? Mostly. So if I go by this design, you want me to paint it blue? Yes, just don't paint over the eyes. After performing many tests to see if this prototype was working correctly it was all done. Now he just needed to fasten the bolts and hope that there would not be any problems during the auction house visit. So, decided on the name. A name. Roland replied to Bernier's question as he was moving things around to get to the blue paint. Normally a craftsman would give something like a golem a designated name. It was a new custom variant of a pre-existing creation but it was different enough to even be called a new model entirely. Well it looks like a spider how about Arachnia 1? Arach what? Isn't that some kind of monster? You sure come up with interesting names, boss. While arachnids existed in this world they were not classified as ones. There of course were spiders but the more scientific names that were more prevalent in his old world were different. It didn't seem that the people from his world cared as much or perhaps they funneled most of their funding into things that could aid the war effort or battling monsters. Oh be quiet, don't forget to put it in the crate when you are gone. I. The painting process wouldn't take much as it was magical in nature. The various alchemic concoctions just required a droplet to change the whole outer layer of the metal it touched to change color. What Bernier only needed to do was touch it with the minimal requirement of this liquid for his job to be done. While there was regular paint here this was much easier and at this point, Roland didn't care about saving a few silver coins by going with the traditional paint job. With most of the work being done now came the part that Roland was not looking forward to. He would need to inform the Lord that he was finished and go down to the auction house along with his product. Roland was fine working for long hours but when it came to socializing he just lost all of his energy. While he had been an introvert even in his past life, his reclusive personality had gotten worse. Probably if he didn't meet up with Bernier or Elidia he would have been living the life of a shut-in. Luckily his unwillingness to work with others forced him to start his own business which he could not really do on his own. So while he did dislike it, he was aware that it was a part of life that could not be avoided. Thus while Bernier was giving the spider golem the finishing touches he decided to pay the city a visit. His robe was in the usual spot along with his half-plate armor that he wore under it. Ever since achieving his new class he had not left his house. Elidia was busy working at the shop and Agni was with her as well. Are you going to the Lord like that? Elidia was the person that gave him the better set of clothes when he met his new partner but he didn't feel that well wearing regular clothes that would put him at a disadvantage. Without any armor that he could inscribe runes on his capabilities to protect himself dwindled significantly. Perhaps if he figured out the spatial runes he could somehow compartmentalize his armor into a smaller bracelet. How he would get it to spring up on his body would probably be the tough part of the design. He didn't feel like the type that cared about those things that much, the deal has already been made my clothes shouldn't matter at this point. I'm also probably not going to meet the Lord, I don't think he spends all his time at the auction house. If you say so, just try not to get into any trouble. Don't worry, I'm not Armand. Elidia burst out into a chuckle while Roland felt a bit more relaxed at the expense of Armand's reputation. Soon both of them said their goodbyes, Agni as always was unwilling to leave his master alone after noticing that he had finally left the workshop. 
but he had become too large for the city, a large dire wolf like him would scare the horses and people. It was refreshing to finally get out of the workshop. Even though this was supposed to be a volcanic region they were far enough to not get any smoke. The air was nice, clean, and without any volcanic ash or sulfur mixed into it. The people at the gate were letting in merchants as usual. The town sure has grown, not sure if I can call it a town anymore. People were now everywhere, while the rush to get a footing in Albrook had died down it only became rowdier. Everyone was working, the power structure had been established which made the workflow more streamlined. But while this might have looked like the right road towards progress he knew otherwise. Just like in all the other cities that he had seen, the gap between people was increasing. The workers with worse classes or ones just saving up for a class change crystal were down on the bottom. They were forced to sign lesser than stellar contracts to cover their expenses and became trapped. Then even when they regained their freedom there would be no spot on the market left for them. To gain freedom they would need to do what he did and try to establish themselves in another growing city. If not they could just bargain with the current business owners for a better contract. While the big bosses at the top were busy with counting money, the people that they were using were too busy to care. If they made enough money to fill their bellies and spend a bit to get drunk it was enough. Roland was convinced that a lot of these people took this as the norm. Without anything similar to a union they didn't have much leverage so they adapted to their circumstances. If they managed to haggle a few coins for themselves? That was more than enough. In others' eyes, he was the strange one. First of all, becoming a human runesmith with no master was difficult, even more so when a person was stuck in a city with a big dwarven presence. Signing a contract with them would not be that outlandish and seen as the normal thing to do. Roland on the other hand was assured that a contract like that would just set him back by many years, or put him on a one-way road where he became nothing more than a rune-crafting slave. While his mind was clouded by thoughts of others he continued to observe. The streets while being busy weren't that well kept. The slums in the distance was also generating a lot of poverty-stricken people that had no way of producing food. The people that decided where the taxes went lined their pockets while others suffered. Now Arthur Valerian appeared out of nowhere. He could somehow steer the budget that he was given to make the lives of the citizens easier. But he could also take it and invest it into the rich merchants or areas that generated more income. Roland was not sure what the right decision would be. On one hand, if the city was cleaned up it could attract more potential investors. With more poverty, there would also be more crime along with the thieves' guild's presence. Contenting with that element would be difficult but if done correctly could offer the city a better path in the future. The easiest method would be to stick to the old tried route. This would keep Arthur in good faith with all the rich merchants and nobles that had invested in them. Perhaps the people at the bottom would somewhat suffer but he would continue to gain money and power. It was the safer choice but it would also not gain him much favor from the citizens. There was a certain limit of the one-sidedness that a city lord could go through with. A thriving city still needed able-bodied people to continue working. If their morale dropped or if they were too hungry to do their jobs the city would go under. The tough part was to balance both sides so that they remained content. If the working force left then the city would suffer but if the business owners didn't profit enough they could do the same. Luckily for Arthur, he did have the dungeon which was a gold mine. Ha, I wonder what he would do if I told him about the Tier 3 passage. Roland's little secret grinding spot was unknown to others. He still wanted to at least reach level 150 before he ever considered speaking out about it. This information was one of the biggest assets he had at the moment. Though without that much personal strength nor contacts he would be signing his death certificate if he let it slip. There were ways of getting information out of people in this world and a secret entrance to a potential B-ranked dungeon was worth smashing some heads in. Finally, after walking for some time and thinking about his new partner in crime he arrived at the auction house. This was the place where he first started out in the city. The sales of his scrolls were doing great before he signed up with the Adventurer Guild. They would still fetch a pretty penny and he only became more proficient at making them. His only gripe with making more scrolls was that he felt that his talents would be better spent elsewhere. 
the scrolls didn't feel that useful when he could inscribe the same spells on almost everything. Pumping them out now wasn't as lucrative as in the old days. With Bernier and Diana working for him now, he could put much better runes on proper equipment. But there was an idea floating in his mind to streamline the process and that was to make a printing press for magic scrolls. With his current knowledge about runes and golems, he might be able to create a program that could transfer his rune smithing ability into a stamp. It would be quite the money maker if I could make some sort of factory to produce scrolls. While making everything by hand would be out of the question, if he could create a prototype to do it for him then it was another thing. The hard part would be to copy over the rune smithing skill into a runic structure yet there was a way now open for him. With his new runic eye of truth skill it could be possible but if he could copy a skill that might not be magic still remain to be seen. Stop, this entrance is reserved for special guests. While thinking about new possibilities he waltzed over to the VIP entrance. The guards here were quick to stop him as he did look somewhat suspicious in the black robe that he was wearing. Here. What are you? Before the guard could continue shouting Roland pulled out his golden supplier card that Arthur gave him. This should be enough, can I go in? To not look too suspicious he removed his hood while showing his face to the guards. This card was proof that he was an important business associate. Yet they couldn't just let him through like that. P please wait a moment, sir. The card needed to be seen by someone that could actually identify it as the correct product. This hired muscle certainly didn't have any skills like that and Roland was still a new face. Probably after this day, they would remember his face. I understand but please hurry. Just as he had expected, another employee appeared along with the guard. They quickly bowed their heads before Roland while he just hand waved it off. With this card in his possession, he would be able to get first class service. No more waiting in lines or for his items to get checked by the person with the identification skill. He would be able to just directly hand whatever he brought over and it would be prioritized by everyone. Is the auction house manager there? The manager? Yes, please come this way, Mr. Roland. While his face wasn't that known around here they needed to show him respect. Not everyone could get that card that Arthur gave him. After passing the guard he was led to the auction house manager's office that was not the same as the one that Arthur greeted him in. It was smaller and on the inside, he found someone that he had never seen before, a plump-looking old man. Welcome Mr. Wayland I have been expecting you, please sit down, would you like to have a drink? The old man had a bright smile on his face and he urged the lady that was probably his assistant to pour them both some alcohol. No, that is fine. I won't take long. I just wanted to report on the item that I was supposed to supply. Ah? Is it ready? The Lord has been curiously asking for its arrival. Did he well, I'll be able to deliver it for the coming auction if that's possible. That's wonderful. The old chubby man seemed ecstatic at the revelation. Before the auction started the young Lord would probably inspect his new investment, if he for some reason disliked the design Roland would probably be set back by many months. Thus the time to present himself to the city merchants once more was on the horizon. Chapter 200, Buyer's Gathering Mr. Wayland, is this necessary? Yes. A strange scene was playing out before a couple of auction house workers. They were tasked to help a VIP out in transporting their wares but the man in question made things difficult. Instead of letting them take the crate with the item that would be auctioned he decided to carry it himself. Roland was somewhat nervous about this day, tonight his golem would be auctioned off. Previously he had agreed to let the people from the auction house take the crate the golem was in and transport it for him. They came with a small carriage that would be large enough to carry the crate and some people in it. But then strange thoughts of thieves and bandits started clouding his judgment. What if something happened to the golem during transit? What if someone decided to steal it before it reached the city? He could not just let these regular workers go as the guards that were with them would probably be overpowered by silver rank adventurers. Don't worry about it, I'll explain it to your boss. Due to the golden card that he showed at the auction house, he was given the VIP treatment. 
Thus the workers that came here were scared that their employer would complain that they let an important customer do all the heavy lifting. He could only reassure them that he would not say anything to get them fired. Let's go then. Roland asked while holding the large box in front of his body with both hands. The golem did weigh quite a bit and it would normally need two grown men but in this world of fantasy stats, it wasn't much of a problem. If Roland really wanted he could sling it onto his shoulder and run with it. Take care. Awoo. Elidia and Agni were there to see him off while Bernier remained back in the workshop. The auction would begin later at night but Roland needed to deliver the goods now. This was an important event for him so he would also stay there to explain a few things to the lead auctioneer. Thus the strange group of people was off, the small carriage was occupied by Roland and the golem. He decided to sit right next to it while using the built-in radar in his runic helmet. Due to his paranoia, he decided to wear his better armor and not the half-plate. If anyone decided to ambush them for some reason he would be able to make quick work of them with the help of his attacking spells. Of course, nothing like this happened and the dots that were on the radar never went too close to the carriage. This was probably due to it having the seal of the Valyrian household. Everyone knew that nobles were very prideful if any bandit dared to attack one of their possessions they would need a quick getaway plan. One that involved hiding from oracle grade tracking magic as the high nobles would spend the extra coin to catch the thief. Thanks to the noble prestige he was allowed to slip into the city without any need to wait in line. The soldiers just parted to the sides while some of the other carriages had to wait and be inspected. They didn't even examine the content, they dared not to go against the symbol of power that was the Valyrian noble crest. Thus when he arrived at the auction house he carried the crate all the way over to the check-in clerk. There he made sure that it arrived at the right VIP storage where he began unpacking. The Lord will be here shortly, you probably have about an hour to prepare Mr. Wayland. Okay, thank you for your help. The previous time Roland was here there was only the chubby manager around. He had only informed him about the golem being ready and then received the date that he should deliver the goods. While normally there would be some kind of appraiser tasked with the inspection for some reason Arthur Valerian also wanted to see it. Thus he was now here preparing for his double inspection which reminded him about the recent class change trial. There he also was graded by it while always getting low grades for his poultry design sense. The golem was made a bit more eye-catching for the potential customers and had many more features than the old variants. For someone that was only a tier 2 runesmith this had been quite the achievement but if other people would see it the same remained to be seen. Roland gently removed the golem from the crate that was filled out with straw. Arachnia 1 was the name that was written on the underside along with the little sun-like logo that he was using for himself. With how much people liked Solaria around here he somewhat hoped that his logo would help him piggyback from all the believers. Just like with the other golems inside of the crate there was a handwritten manual. His drawing skills had actually improved and after getting the engineer class he was able to get the artistic drawing skill. Probably the main reason for getting it was the creativity skill, together with them he was able to draw up a realistic representation of the golem on paper. All of the parts were listed and explained, if the owner had any semblance of intelligence they would be able to easily control his creation. The biggest limiting factor was the metal rod that he was holding in his hand. This was a rather inefficient way of handling the golems. It was a large headache for the craftsman that had to pre-program various commands that the owner would utter. While there was a pre-existing database it didn't cover all the bases or types of machines. I don't think the new owner will complain too much, as long as it has all the common command words it should be fine. Golems were already widespread magical constructs. They were divided into some categories like battle golems and transport golems. What he only needed to do was be sure to have his creation follow what was seen as common. If Arachnia 1 wouldn't be able to perform a backflip it would be fine, it just needed to do what people expected from it, then if he could go above the expectations and add a few innovations it would make his product worth more. That is if the buyers didn't find the additional functions to be useful. For the time being his golem was a mix of a few variants but it was not really exceptional at one thing in particular. It could give long-range magical support to adventurers but there were better battle golems out there. 
It could use some mining attachments and carry loot but there were also better solutions for that. Even his own mule-type golem had a vastly larger capacity for carrying. Maybe someone will see the collector value in it. Roland gave out a sigh while going through all the small parts. The inspection went by smoothly and soon he heard a commotion outside, the Lord had finally arrived. The heavy footsteps of the guards that went to meet him outside were very telling. Good day, Mr. Wayland I see you are finished. Arthur Valerian was quite a handsome man, he was wearing a somewhat militaristic uniform which made him stand out from the crowd. He could already see the poor young man being sold off to some old rich noble widow if he wasn't successful in this city. While bad marriage prospects were mostly forced onto the women, the men weren't that far behind. Depending on their worth they could be shoved into an unwelcome situation. This might have been his fate if he was ever deemed to remain in the old Arden estate. He would probably be forced to become a knight and then marry some random knight's daughter to proliferate the line. His kids then would be forced to work under the reigning Arden estate head that would be one of his older brothers. Luckily for the past few years, he was granted respite, Robert had not told his secret either. Good day, my lord as you can see, the golem is ready. Roland replied while looking at the person standing to the side of Arthur. It was the personal maid that never seemed to stray too far from him. It was clear that she served as more than just a maid. Even when the knights remained outside she was always there with him. This was nothing out of the ordinary. Most of the high nobles would have some personal guards that always remained with their masters. It was for their noble lord's well-being as well as for their own. If anything happened to the noble they were serving it would be their heads that were on the line. Roland didn't explain much as Arthur was quick to take the control rod from him. Even before activation he also asked for the instruction manual through which he read through at a blazing speed. Fascinating this one is a lot different than the previous one. Yes, I have made some improvements. The two started talking while receiving strange glances from the maid named Mary. Roland was quite nonchalant about it but a normal person would have a rather hard time when speaking to a noble. Even though he was looking away he listed some of the commands that the golem was able to shuffle through. This guy really does find these interesting. Arthur Valerian's eyes were wide open, he was like a kid in a candy store. His blue golem paraded through the storage room while he continued to give it some orders. One that even caused the guards from the outside to burst through the room as Arthur ordered it to shoot at the crate, a command that the Lord would not be aware of if he didn't go through the instruction manual correctly. My Lord. Haha. <laughs> Don't worry I'm fine but I think we will need a new crate for this golem. Soon the smoking wood was extinguished and the lead auctioneer visited him instead. It was a rather alluring looking elven lady with good proportions. It was the oldest trick in the book to have the auctioneer be attractive to have the buyers show off their deep purses. The time started passing as he handed over the instruction manual and tried giving this woman some pointers on the presentation. Thanks to him having the VIP treatment he got her to listen well. Normally the presenter wouldn't go out of their way this much but when a product that was unique came along they would rehearse their words well. Thank you Mr. Wayland I think this will be enough, you can return to your home or wait for the auction to take place, we have reserved a seat for you in the hall. After showing off the golem to all the important workers it was carried out in a new box. Now he only needed to wait for the presentation to go through and see how much gold he could earn for it. Even now he wasn't hoping for much, the golem was a custom model from a craftsman that was being shunned by the Dwarven Union. Normally it would have been a big risk to invest money into an unknown element but he still had some hopes. It's out of my hands now. Roland decided to remain here all the way until the auction was over. His creation would be presented a bit later so that the buyers could get their toes dipped first. After a couple of lesser products, they would start auctioning off the pricey items that they always spread rumors about. His seat was somewhat in the back as he didn't want to stand out. This large auction hall looked like it was made for a play. There were three balconies for the more prominent members of the city with the middle one being reserved for important nobles. But with Arthur Valerian remaining in the main office above it was devoid of anyone that important. Those booths are for the rich merchants wait, is that? Roland peeked at the western balcony that was slowly filling up. 
he was sitting on the opposite side of it just on the lower level. If he didn't look he would have probably missed it but two bearded men that he was familiar with just entered it. Normally he was planning to remove his helmet during the auction as there was no danger here. Now on the other hand he decided to not remove it as its feature could aid him. The armor was capable of listening in on people thanks to a simple spell. It was connected to his helmet through which he could hear the conversation that the dwarves were having now. Oi do we really need to come for this? I, now held your wine and we need to see what that bastard made. It was instantly clear that the dwarves named Bamur and Dunan had been informed about his involvement. From what he knew, his involvement in the auction house wasn't specifically announced. They never mentioned what exactly the runic item would be, not giving the specifics would only entice people to come over. It seemed that someone from the auction house had talked. Who it was would be hard to deduct as even some of the regular guards could have overheard someone talking. He had also visited the auction house this week. They could have already had someone inform the dwarves about his visit which correlated with this magical item reveal. This isn't entirely bad though. This was something he expected to happen so he wasn't that worried. Perhaps with the dwarves being here the product, he was trying to peddle could actually sell for more than he expected. Would a dwarven craftsman let some random merchants get their hands on a golem they had never seen before? Probably not. While the Dwarven Union had deep pockets this didn't mean that there were no other heavy hitters with them. Various rich merchants were also there along with someone he really didn't expect to see. This man stood out from the crowd as he was very muscular and bald why is the guild master here? The leader of the adventurer guild had decided to show up for some reason. Most of the money flowing into the city went through that guild so his purchasing power was quite high as well. Besides them, he also spotted some store owners and some people from the merchant guild. After the rich merchants filled up the two balconies, the regular ones started flooding into the bottom section. He would normally be sitting up with the rich due to his VIP status but for now, he refused as he wanted to remain anonymous. Covered in a dark robe and without his armor showing he would somewhat mix into the crowd with all the other people. Soon the curtain was yanked to the side and the lovely elven lady that he met before walked out onto the stage. She was wearing a form-fitting red dress with a lot of upper chest area showing, clearly to entice the many men that were in the crowd. She gave a little introduction speech that was probably rehearsed many times before the first item was brought out. The auction was finally in full swing but while Roland was getting nervous two people were having a discussion. They had a nice view over the whole auction from their semi-secret spot that was the auction house owner's office. He does seem to be bothered by those Dwarven Union fellows, doesn't he, my lord? Arthur Valerian was just sitting there together with Mary and looking over everything. It was clear as day that Roland was taking glances to the side from the moment the Dwarven Union representatives showed up. Wish I could see his face, that man is hard to read Mary, why don't you go help our friend out? I thought you'd never ask, Lord Arthur. Mary smiled while placing a mask over her face along with a somewhat large hat. How do I look? Like someone that has more money than reason. Arthur replied while Mary slowly walked out from the room. Her body was covered in expensive looking jewelry and the dress she had on was made from quite the costly material. Soon the auction would start but Arthur knew that with the help of his maid, Roland could potentially make a lot more money than he thought.